Good morning. My name is Jason Gershowitz, and I'll be uh, teaming with the NYSERDA team to facilitate today's uh, Hydrogen in New York State State of the Science kickoff webinar. We're excited to share so much content with you today and hear lots of great questions along the way. Um, if you can hear my voice, you are in the right place. And uh, if you're seeing a slide on your screen here that's a, a cover slide, then you are also in the right location. Uh, if you're having any difficulty with today's meeting, please reach out to support here so that we can make sure um, we're able to, to help you as we turn to get started. Thank you to the folks that uh, connected early, both on our uh, panelists and presenters to make sure that all of our technology is working well and participants getting connected early so we're able to start promptly. Uh, it is uh, 9.01 uh, a.m. Eastern time here, um, and we have a couple of just quick announcements here before we, we turn to sort of our formal getting started. So uh, in, in just a moment here, while, while I'm sharing, uh, you're going to see a message in the chat pod. Um, if we could go ahead and share that um, and what we're eager to hear from you is if, if you can let us know, um, you know, your name, your organization, uh, perhaps in one thing you're interested in hearing about during this webinar series on hydrogen and the future of New York state. Um, we're we're going to try to do a little sort of real time crosswalk between that and the agenda that we've got and other topics that we know we're eager to cover in, in future uh, state of the science events as well. So. Um, please take a moment to kind of marinate on that question and, and uh, share any any ideas that pop to mind, uh, completely optional. Um, we, we are eager to, to share today and, and try to advance some of our objectives for this shared space, um, including some introductions and sort of background knowledge on key hydrogen topics for stakeholders with a range of perspectives and subject matter familiarity. Um, we wanted to make sure that we kind of know where the various things are going on. So trying to, to level set and share a little bit more on ongoing activities is connected to some of the key considerations that um, might need to be reflected in discussions around hydrogen and across future programming. That could include environmental justice impacts, labor and workforce development, grid reliability, technology readiness, um, and many others. A couple of folks that are starting to share here in the in the chat, letting us know. Um, that you're out there. Thank you. And we're going to, we, we know we have a, a higher RSVP count um, than we have participation here. So we're going to give folks just another minute or two um, while we uh, give them an opportunity to get started here after what was uh, a long weekend, I think, for many. Um, just as a, a sneak peek here, as we go through today's meeting, um, we will review the agenda and ask folks to please um, share uh, using the Q&A pod if you've got questions that you want to be considered by the folks that are sharing now. I also just want to encourage you, if there's anything that's on your mind, um, please feel free to use that Q&A pod to share uh, that with the team so that we can try to make sure we connect that to the right uh, discussion or moment in the conversation. So if you have a thought about a topic that's coming up in the agenda, but not the one we're talking now, I would say share it as soon as you've got it so that we can try to fold it all in. Um, and as we go through uh, today's agenda, uh, that'll be the primary way for participants to share will be through that Q&A function, um, which we'll review um, and we'll ask that uh, you please interact in that Q&A function openly, honestly, and respectfully about a range of different perspectives here. Um, and that if you could listen with care and sensitivity to those perspectives, um, there's a, a wealth of uh, knowledge that will be shared um, from diverse backgrounds during today's a state of the science session and in future conversations and, and also a, a great diverse group of uh, registrants, I think, here so far. Um, and it looks like we've got many on the line, but maybe we'll still give folks just another minute here and then I'll turn it over to the NYSERDA team for some introductions. So, again, my name is Jason Gershowitz. I'll be the facilitating today working closely with Ian Latimer. Um, who you'll be hearing from momentarily. Ian's a senior project management manager at NYSERDA. Um, and he's with uh, NYSERDA's clean energy setting and innovation teams, uh, where he specializes in working directly with communities, local governments, and other stakeholders to pursue responsible siting and development for a variety of clean energy technologies. Uh, Ian's responsibilities include clean energy resource and training development, community engagement across NYSERDA's New York Sun, and much more. And uh, with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to Ian here to kick us off. So, Ian, jump in and take it away. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jason. Really, really appreciate the, the introductory words and my sincere thanks to everybody for coming back from a long weekend and deciding to talk hydrogen with us for a few hours. Can't imagine anything better. 
Um, it is my pleasure to uh, to welcome our uh, president and CEO of NYSERDA, Doreen Harris, to provide some opening remarks today. Um, I'm sure that many of you on the call are familiar with Doreen, but for those that may not be, uh, Doreen was appointed president and CEO of NYSERDA in April of 2021, uh, having served as acting president and CEO since June of 2020. Uh, Doreen has held public and private sector leadership roles pertaining to clean energy projects and engineering for more than 20 years. And throughout her time at NYSERDA has held executive, technical, and policy positions, including as the Vice President for Large Scale Renewables. Um, Doreen has been heavily involved in the development of uh, renewables under the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act and the Clean Energy Standard, and has been heavily involved in the work of the Climate Action Council, uh, co-leading that activity alongside our colleagues with the Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, so with that, Doreen, sincere thanks to you for joining us for some introductory remarks. Uh, the floor is yours. Great. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Ian, uh, for not only the introduction, but also really spearheading the development of this series. I'm really excited at the opportunity to dig into the science here with each of you. And we've, we've used this model in a number of scenarios um, with a number of technologies, really, across our state. And I'm excited specifically at the opportunity here um, to talk about hydrogen. Um, so, as described, uh, I'm Doreen Harris, the President and CEO of the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, or NYSERDA. We're the state's clean energy and energy innovation agency. And as Ian mentioned, um, I also co-chair uh, New York's Climate Action Council. So, it places us in a position, really, to both be implementing technologies toward the achievement of our goals, but also to be planning for the longer-term future of our state. And so today's um, webinar, the State of the Science Hydrogen webinar, is the first in a series of events that's intended to highlight and evaluate a variety of hydrogen-related topics of interest across New York and in the Northeast region. And, and as I see it, today's event serves as a level-setting session. Um, our first session, um, of course, but it is also necessary to highlight key priorities and ongoing questions around clean hydrogen here in New York, and establishing shared knowledge around the fundamentals of hydrogen. So throughout this series, we will cover topics such as hydrogen's potential role in decarbonizing transportation, opportunities for hydrogen in district heating and cooling, evaluation of emissions associated with clean hydrogen, and more. This series is a part of and informs our proactive information gathering and learning approach as we evaluate potential roles for clean hydrogen and achieving our state's ambitious uh, climate and decarbonization goals under the Climate Act. And it is true that we are considering all technologies to achieve the Climate Act goal of an 85% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And as the Climate Action Council's draft scoping plan outlines, hydrogen is expected to support our overall decarbonization efforts in New York State, particularly in certain sectors such as transportation and industry. In fact, just uh, this month, I had the chance to ride in a hydrogen fuel cell heavy duty truck, as well as a light duty passenger vehicle, the Mirai, as part of a demonstration by Toyota of fuel cell electric vehicle technologies. It was a great opportunity to see this technology up close and experience the potential of clean hydrogen in helping to reduce emissions from our transportation sector and fleet vehicles um, specifically. We are also interested in learning about hydrogen's potential in non-transportation applications, such as manufacturing, heavy duty industry, long duration and seasonal energy storage, backup power, and microgrid solutions, and other opportunities where hydrogen may help reduce emissions and provide resiliency benefits at the same time. In addition, we are excited to continue working with our hydrogen partners announced in March, including Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and now nearly 50 partners to collaborate on developing and submitting a winning proposal to the United States Department of Energy to receive federal investment and designation as one of the nation's hydrogen hubs here in the Northeast region. So today's State of the Science webinar is an important complement to our overall efforts to learn, explore, and advance critical opportunities for clean hydrogen in New York State. And we welcome your feedback on the format and other topics of interest as this series continues. 
So with that, again, thank you for joining us this morning and I'll turn it back to Ian to begin what I know will be an informative session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doreen. Always, always a pleasure to have you here and I appreciate the remarks. Um, I'm actually going to hand it right over to Jason Gershowitz, who's going to go ahead and lead us through um, a brief introductory facilitation exercise, as well as reviewing the agenda uh, for today's session. So, Jason, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ian. And I, I just want to um, remind folks there was a comment in the chat pod here um, from Trevor uh, Reddick, a, a co-facilitator, and just ask you to consider if you want to share your name, your organization, and one thing you're interested in hearing about during this webinar. And um, that's kind of what we're we're eager to try to synthesize in real time here um, as we review our, our agenda and our process forward. I'd also like to just remind folks that today's meeting is being recorded um, and uh, the recording will be available at nicerta.newyork.gov slash hydrogen uh, as soon as it's available. Um, and again, if you're having any technical difficulties, please uh, contact Tricia King at nicerta.newyork.gov. That information should be with your registration materials as well. Um, so, in terms of our agenda today, um, we've got a, a lot that we're trying to cover in a short amount of time. Um, we, we've started today's meeting at uh, 9 Eastern and we're, we're uh, going to be completing today's meeting at 1. Um, and we have uh, starting with a, a hydrogen introduction and overview session. So, eager to like to, to sort of explore a little bit more around a clear understanding of hydrogen opportunities and priorities. Um, in, in terms of what is hydrogen and what does it mean and what is the context in this conversation. Uh, as we move into our second topic, we'll be exploring hydrogen in New York State, which will include the role of hydrogen in the Climate Act and other New York State activities and programs, uh, including those referenced uh, by Governor Kathy Hochul's 2022 State of the State Address. Um, and then we'll move into a session on environmental justice and hydrogen, uh, including an overview of key environmental justice considerations in relation to uh, hydrogen activities. Uh, there'll be an opportunity to highlight key concerns as well as priority opportunities, including New York State and federally disadvantaged community benefits frameworks and criteria. Um, we have a 10 minute break that we're going to take because uh, four hours is too much time to go without a break. We appreciate as well that um, you, you may need to step away from your computers um, feel free to let us know if that's something that you need to do along the way. And again, uh, the meeting will be recorded uh, for future reference. If you do need to take a quick break, we anticipate that break will be around 1055, um, but that may move up or back a little bit pending uh, pending conversation uh, that we see in other spaces. Coming back from our break, um, we're going to have a sort of a sprint of hydrogen primer sessions, including an overview of production um, and clean hydrogen definitions. Um, so the, that includes introductory presentation on hydrogen production processes. So there are there are color descriptors that are often used when describing hydrogen, um, as well as the U.S. Department of Energy's definition of clean hydrogen. Um, and we'll touch on other topics like economics, technical feasibility, uh, distribution versus centralized production, and more. Um, including workforce development and other environmental impacts. Um, we'll then move into a conversation about electrolyzers and fuel cells. So these are key technology building blocks that can help to inform discussions of hydrogen applications and end uses. Uh, and uh, there will be related issues um, or, or additional conversation about some of those uh, ways in which convert hydrogen into electricity as tied to some of the definitions that were mentioned above. Um, and then we'll move into conversation about delivery and storage here. Uh, including methods, materials, and safety. Uh, and lastly, um, we do have a, a, a chunk of time that we're reserving at the end of our conversation for some real-time synthesis and ideation. So what we're eager to do there is to take stock, all the great questions that we're excited to hear from you in the Q&A function throughout today's workshop. Um, we're gonna be synthesizing in real time. We'll try to sort of make informal notes about where topics we've been able to talk about, what we might need to cover in future conversations. Um, and then to kind of just quickly take, take a sense of what's what's out there that we haven't covered, what's missing that folks are eager to hear more about um, and uh, across those things, what might sort of float to the top to help inform NYSERDA's uh, continued planning for engagement. I do wanna move us along to a couple of quick ground rules and we'll be quite brief here, but uh, again, uh, and this is on the next slide, please, John. Um, we'll be honoring the agenda, so we do have uh, a thoughtful process here to try to capture all of the different topics that will serve as these initial found foundation blocks for discussion around uh, hydrogen. Um, and again, please share anything that you've got in that Q&A feature along the way, even if it doesn't apply to the current conversation. Um, it'll help the facilitation team capture that and figure out where it might fit in in today's or future conversation. Um, we are using that chat function, as we mentioned um, earlier here, uh, in particular to ask this question about your name, your organization, and, and one uh, aspiration that you've got for today's conversation. 
Um, and uh, we'll ask for you to keep continued Q&A uh, contributions uh, meaningful and, and sort of helping to make sure that we're honing in on the what we need to be discussing here today. Um, so with that, I would like to just briefly sort of recap a couple of things that we're seeing. So some of the responses to the question are to everyone um, in the chat. So you can see where folks have opted to do that. A few things have been shared um, just directly with the facilitation team. And then we also have a, a wealthy uh, body of submissions as part of the RSVP process as well uh, to register for today's event of additional topics to, to explore. Um, so just to give you a sense of what's already out there, um, we've got um, thoughts related to um, the amount of renewables um, to, uh, to produce hydrogen and related cost analysis. Um, there are a couple of things that are coming in on that sort of value proposition. Um, we've got local power generation um, and what that might mean for fleet concentrated high power um, electric vehicle charging or medium and heavy vehicles as well. Um, electrolyzer behavior and how they behave with time and varying power input. Um, so how they can handle, for example, um, the output of a wind um, facility. Um, there are some questions that are emerging around blending rates. Um, there are some, some great questions, a couple on storage and what liquid storage materials uh, look like or uh, what's needed and related odorants or code compliance, um, and spe specifically code 255. Um, we've got hydrogen use in microgrids um, and grid to wheel efficiency. Um, supply and demand analysis as well in regards to heavy duty transport. So um, digging a little bit more into some of our uses um, as well on supply and demand for heavy industrial processes or uh, for power production. Um, and then there's a, a number of items that are coming in that are a little bit more connected to the broader supply chain um, and what activities might be needed to support different aspects of the supply chain um, related funding opportunities, uh, connectivity to international policy and learning. Um, and uh, funding opportunities uh, for state plans to encourage offtakes to transit uh, to hydrogen fuel. So those are just a couple of examples. That's not by any means a conclusive list, um, but I do wonder if you've, if you've joined us uh, perhaps a little bit later to today's conversation or, or haven't had an opportunity to share yet, if there's one thing you're interested in hearing about during today's webinar series, um, please do share that in the, the chat pod right now. Um, and I'll give the team a, an, another minute or two to try to help figure out where those things could uh, get a little bit more connected. I see a couple of other responses that are coming in around regional manufacturing, um, regional market development, um, some more participants coming from a microgrid perspective, more on funding opportunities. So it's a lot of, as you can see, there's a lot of uh, a wide range of interests here that we're hearing from you all already um, as we move into our conversation i'm hopeful that uh i think our, our introduction and overview session uh and the hydrogen in new york state might help to address some of the things that are connected here to um, at least continue the conversation in regards to uh, potential applications or regionality um and then as we move into after the sessions after our break i think a number of those uh sessions like H uh, hydrogen technologies electrolyzers and fuel cells will be a, a key one that'll be able to answer um at least a few of those uh, submissions that I've just reviewed. See a couple additional things coming in in regards to regulations and the regulatory environment, what's needed to uh, facilitate um, things like hydrogen adoption or transportation. Some good questions and exploring more on international um, benchmarking or lessons learned, ways to continue to capture and, and grow together. So with that, I'm gonna propose that we uh, move to our, our next session here. Uh, which will be a hydrogen introduction and overview. Um, and having already uh, introduced Ian briefly, I'll just add a little bit more to note um, that uh, Ian does also help lead uh, stakeholder engagement activities in New York State evaluates potential roles and opportunities for hydrogen in meeting our decarbonization and energy goals. So we heard a little bit from Ian earlier in teeing some things up and eager to hear from you a little bit more, Ian, in this next session. Um, we're also gonna be hearing uh, from Michael Colvin, who's the Director of Regulatory and Legislar Legislative Affairs uh, for California at EDF. Um, and as in that role, uh, Michael leads EDF's California Energy Policy Advocacy, focusing on strategies for transitioning California's energy markets from gas-powered electricity to clean energy. Uh, Michael has a broad focus working on a portfolio spanning building decarbonization, gas utility business models, wholesale electricity markets, and transportation electrification matters. Across each of these issues, Michael's focus is on minimizing investment risk and aligning utility incentives with affordable, clean, and safe energy services. 
Prior to joining EDF, Michael spent 10 years at the California Public Utilities Commission working on various energy and utility safety matters. Uh, and I hope that you will uh, join me in welcoming Ian and Michael uh, to uh, this, this next session, if we could go to the next slide there on introduction uh, for hydrogen and an overview. As a reminder, uh, we'll be shifting to sort of the Q&A function from for here on out for the next chunk of the agenda. So we'll make that adjustment now and please do share questions as you've got them. This will just allow our team to best intake them all and help figure out what we can weave into the existing agenda sessions, future sessions, um, or for that uh, end of uh, today's workshop ideation and exploration session. With that, Ian, take it away. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, and before we go anywhere further, I just want to take a moment to say that uh, we we stand on the shoulders of giants here in this uh, facilitation team. We were very fortunate to have a, a really great uh, advisory group that helped us to put together an agenda and identify some great speakers, including um, Michael Colvin from the Environmental Defense Fund, who we'll be hearing from in just a few minutes. So I just wanted to take a minute. I think we've got some of our advisory group members here in attendance, uh, maybe not all of them, but just want to say uh, our whole goal here has been to design stakeholder engagement and programming that is responsive and reflective of the concerns and priorities across our stakeholders. And so I just want to say thank you for, for helping us to do that. And if we haven't done that today, we sure hope to do that in future sessions as well. Um, and feedback from all of you in attendance, um, including those in the advisory group, is what is able or what enables us to do that. Um, so I really appreciate all the work that's gone into this and um, look forward to the rest of the session and uh, future sessions. Um, I'm also very mindful that many of those in attendees are uh, far more experts in hydrogen than I am. So you'll spare me my uh, my mistakes if we uh, as we do a couple of minutes on the sort of introduction to hydrogen in the space uh, before we turn to a, a guided discussion with Michael Colvin from the Environmental Defense Fund. So uh, next slide, please. I will, I will keep it brief. Um, really, when it comes to the introduction to hydrogen, I'm going to break it down to, you know, a couple of uh, building block questions. We're going to talk about the what, we're going to talk about the how, we're going to talk about the why. Um, when it comes to talking about the what, I think many of us are probably pretty familiar with hydrogen, and we're familiar with it as the most abundant and the simplest element in the universe. Um, hydrogen, often referred to as H2, uh, two hydrogen atoms in a molecule of hydrogen, um, which has a lot of potential um, as an energy carrier. It's not a source of energy. Um, so I think a lot of the times when we see the discourse around hydrogen, um, it can be a bit confusing because it's mentioned alongside, um, you know, renewable generation sources like wind and solar, um, hydropower, other things like that. Um, but rather, we should be thinking about hydrogen as an energy carrier, much like we think about electricity, the way we think about the roles and opportunities of uh, batteries and other energy storage mediums. Um, that's really how we should be thinking about hydrogen here. And hydrogen presents some really unique characteristics, which shape everything from its production to its storage and delivery and eventual uses across different applications. Um, and some of those characteristics are it's extremely high in energy density by weight, while being extremely low in energy density by volume. And that has implications for, again, how we are storing and delivering that hydrogen, which we are really fortunate to be learning about later in today's session um, when we welcome some folks from a couple of our national labs to talk about uh, storage, delivery, and safety when it comes to hydrogen. Um, for me, really, when I'm thinking about hydrogen, I want to make it very clear that we are thinking about it as a versatile tool in our decarbonization toolkit or the toolbox. It's not about supplanting the need for electrification and energy efficiency and renewable generation. It's about trying to understand you know, where it fits in, what the opportunities are in terms of complementing our known existing strategies that are gonna help us meet our clean energy and decarbonization goals. Uh, so that's the what. We'll talk about the how. Um, and there's a few different hows that I like to think about when we're thinking about you know, what hydrogen is and, and understanding the space. Um, the three primary ones that I usually think about are how you're producing that hydrogen. So what is the process for its production? Uh, what is the feedstock that you're using to get that hydrogen because it does not uh, exist on its own in terms of being a hydrogen gas on Earth, which I'll talk about in just a second. Uh, the other how I'm thinking about is how you power that production. You know, where are those electrons uh, coming from? Where is that heat coming from? How are, what is the process for, you know, deriving that hydrogen? And then the third big how, which, uh, you know, by, by virtue of the many potential applications for hydrogen, we are not going to be able to get into all of the hows of how you use it in today's session, but we will look to spend that time in future sessions where we can really get into the details in terms of various applications for hydrogen. Um, I mentioned just a minute ago that, you know, hydrogen in itself as a gaseous form does not exist on its own in Earth. And that is because hydrogen is typically part of a more complicated compound um, that's 
everywhere around us. Um, you know, the most common examples where we see or hear about hydrogen being produced is being derived from water using a process called electrolysis, which we'll be learning about this afternoon. Um, but we all know H2O, that H2 is hydrogen. Um, when you think about ethanol, again, uh, you know, ethanol, methane, and octane, all of which you see on, on the middle and the right there, those are all hydrocarbons. And the hydro in hydrocarbon comes from the bonding of those hydrogen atoms to other, um, other materials like carbon or oxygen. Um, and so the really, the, the question becomes, you know, how do you produce it? How do you power its production? And how do you use it in a way that is aligning with our goals here? Um, because once it's separated, hydrogen can and will be used um, and already is being used for a variety of applications and purposes. And so the final question as part of the introduction before we uh, bring in uh, Michael here is about the why. You know, why are we talking about hydrogen? Why is it seeing increased interest in 2022 relative to the last few years? It's cyclical and none, none of us are hearing about hydrogen for the first time. Well, it's not new and it's not that niche either. The U.S. is already producing around 10 million metric tons of hydrogen, which is nearly all what we're referred to as gray hydrogen, meaning it's derived from natural gas. Um, it's typically being produced and used in conjunction with each other as part of oil refining or other industrial applications like ammonia, methanol, steel production, or being used as a chemical feedstock. Um, one of the other reasons that we are talking about hydrogen, in addition to it being an existing you know, substance, an existing substance that's used in a number of different ways, is that the feasibility and availability of large-scale renewables and distributed renewables have changed the ability to think about how we can produce and use hydrogen. Um, one of the other reasons that we're thinking about hydrogen and looking at it like this is that you know, New York and also the rest of the country and many other states are eyeing some pretty ambitious decarbonization and emissions reduction targets. And because of the numerous potential applications for hydrogen, whether you're looking to use it as a low carbon fuel, as a feedstock, as an energy carrier, as we discussed a moment ago, those various applications mean it has the potential to play a number of different opportunities. The question really becomes digging into what those opportunities are, what those priorities are, what the guardrails should be in terms of pursuing hydrogen. Um, and finally, why we're talking about it today, again, because of, you know, that broad interest, um, there is excitement, there is interest, and there is caution at a variety of levels from our community-based organizations all the way through state leadership and federal leadership and even globally. Um, there's a lot of airtime being devoted to hydrogen. We are no exception in that way by virtue of having an event like this and future programming. Um, but what we're really looking to do here is create a forum for more objective science-based discussion um, and really sort of dig into the details here. Um, so as part of digging into the details in this introduction, if you'll go to the next slide, please. Um, as Jason mentioned earlier, we are extremely fortunate to be joined by Michael Colvin, again, Director of Regulatory and Legislative Affairs for the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, I've linked here in the slides, which will be shared, a couple of relevant materials, uh, studies and reports that the Environmental Defense Fund has put together in the last couple of years, which are relevant to the discussion that Michael and I will be having this morning. Um, so please look for those when you access the slides. And with that, um, I would like to welcome Michael into uh, the video here. Um, John, I think we can stop sharing the screen for now, uh, just to make our faces as, as big as they can be. Um, thank you so much. Hi, Michael. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And for, uh, for me, who's in the know, I know that it's pretty early your time on the West Coast. So again, thank you so much for, for spending your morning with us after the holiday weekend. Uh, it's my pleasure. Um, so perhaps as a jumping off point, you know, I think one of the reasons that we reached out and are so glad to have you here is that there was a lot of interest in the work that you and the, the team at the Environmental Defense Fund have done uh, around hydrogen in the state of California, particularly, but also nationally. Um, so what I think would be great as a jumping off point would be to understand the context of how you or the team at EDF uh, were able to get involved in evaluating the potential opportunities for hydrogen in California. Would you mind maybe just sort of giving us an introduction to how you guys got into this conversation and what you've seen in, in the state? Uh, yeah, uh, well, first off, uh, thank you all so much for, for being here today. And, uh, you know, I, I think I should say, uh, you know, first off, you know, I am, uh, not the, the, this session is called uh, state of the science. I am not a scientist. We do have incredible science members, uh, at EDF and I am sort of speaking on their behalf. Um. But I think part of EDS role and sort of our special sauce as an environmental nonprofit is to take the best information that we have from the scientific community, from the legal community, and from the business community and try and blend them together 
to find uh, the ways that work for environmental outcomes and hydrogen is no exception. Um, for me, in the California context, when we were first starting to look at hydrogen a few years ago, it really was coming from, uh, you know, from a mixture of, well, what's the current thrust of the science and how do we adapt hydrogen into our existing frameworks and what ways does that make sense? And in particular, we were looking at it from a power generation perspective. How can we make electricity from this and how can we use it uh, frankly, to avoid a stranded asset problem for our existing gas infrastructure. And so there were some basic questions that came up from that of, well, if we had this as a fuel uh, that was going through our gas pipeline system, what are the questions that we need to be thinking about? Would our gas system be able to handle it? If we were going to make power from this, electricity from this, could the turbines handle it? Could the electricity system handle it? What are the needs? What are the profiles? And so that just started us down uh, um, a couple of pathways in terms of asking some questions and, and doing some models. Um, a couple of just sort of really high level observations. Um, and then I know you have some questions to get into, into more of the specifics. The first one is hydrogen can be many things to many people. Um, that's wonderful. I think that's a, a huge amount of potential there. In order to realize the promise of that potential, we have to install certain safeguards. Um, that includes both uh, thinking about hydrogen from a leakage perspective, and I'll get more into that in a few moments. Um, that includes the production process, which you started to briefly touch on and think through how do we make, uh, don't make a problem worse as we're trying to find new solutions. Um, and then from a utility perspective, if we are going to be making new investments to accommodate different fuels into the system, whether it be the electricity system or the gas system, how do we make certain that those investments are just and reasonable and that they're going to result in safe and reliable service, sort of the bread and butter of utility speak, but also thinking through and what customers are going to benefit from that um, and, and why? And so part of the analysis that we've been trying to do is to, start, is to think through, well, what applications, what end uses of hydrogen make the most sense and what customers are attached to that and how do we help think through, is that the most cost effective option for customers? I think, uh, in, Ian, in your initial uh, presentation, you were sort of saying in the, in the, in the why part, you know, why are we using hydrogen for all these different customer bases? My observation is that we could technically use hydrogen in a lot of applications. It is a very power intensive production process to use hydrogen for certain end uses. So you have to stop by and ask another why question is, you know, why are we using hydrogen in this application? Is this the most cost effective option? And there are a lot of them that in my you know, personal analysis are not the first, burst, first and best end uses out there. So we want to think through, are there other options that are more cost effective, that are more readily available? And because hydrogen is going to be frankly really expensive to start off with, how do we prioritize as best as we can? Um, so those are some of the kind of the initial questions that sort of kick off that I was thinking through. I'm happy to get into more detail on any of those. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you for that start, Michael. And, and I think, you know, sort of pivoting that, one of the places, as I understand it, that the Environmental Defense Fund has been particularly, you know, focused on hydrogen has been around the conversations for uh, firm, pass, firm power and firm capacity uh, in terms of looking towards the future of the grid in California. Um, so I just wanted to sort of get an understanding maybe, um, you know, recognizing changing climate and the challenging heat and weather events as we're thinking about resiliency and firm power for the grid. Um, I'm curious if you could maybe speak to, you know, the, the work that you and the team at EDF have done um, in terms of the potential opportunities for hydrogen, recognizing the need for firm capacity on the grid. Sure. Um, so to provide a little bit of context, because I'm assuming this is mostly a New York based audience and California is a got a different regulatory context. Um, California passed a law a few years back, uh, Senate Bill 100, SB 100, which stated that by 2045, California was gonna have a 100% carbon neutral electric grid. 60% um, of that was gonna be defined renewables as the state law has defined it. And the other 40% was going to be, frankly, relatively squishy. It's relatively undefined, uh, especially for California. Um, 
but it was supposed to be carbon neutral. Um, and you know, this is the first carbon neutral electric law that uh, anywhere in the US has passed. And EDF took a step back and said, that's amazing. Can we do it? Uh, but, you, know, you know, it's one thing to pass a law. It's another thing to start doing the planning to actually make that law happen. And so we did this very sort of holistic, uh, you know, ground up uh, exercise, thought exercise of, well, what will it take to get to a carbon neutral electric grid? Um, and we employed three sets of power production models, um, a group from E3, a group from Stanford, and a group from Princeton, um, thinking one model good, three model better. Um, and maybe they'll eventually start to converge on the truth and start to model out uh, from a production perspective, can California fully decarbonize its electric system? And by the way, it's not just about converting over the existing electric grid, but we're also anticipating as uh, we're going to use that uh, carbon neutral electric system to decarbonize other huge swaths of the economy, uh, transportation and buildings being the two largest of new electric load growth. So, in addition to converting over the elect existing electric uh, capacity, it would also have to be growing that capacity conservatively two to three X above today's baseline. So, a lot of electric growth and a lot of new capacity to kind of convert over. The good news, and uh, you, you have a link to this, but if those of you wanting to figure out and dig into the details a little bit more, uh, we published all this at edf.org slash clean firm power. Um, the good news is that the models will solve, that we can get an affordable and reliable electric system. Uh, the models are all dispatch models, and so if the models solve, that means they, something can be done reliably. That's wonderful. That's sort of you know, threshold number one. But the thing that we started to look at was what were going to be the cost implications, that it makes no sense to build a clean and reliable grid if nobody can afford it to, to be a member of it. The result that ended up showing up was we are going to build a massive amount of solar and short duration batteries in any scenario. Uh, California is a renewable rich state. We have a lot of solar potential out here. Um, and that is, uh, at least of right now, a very cost effective option for the most part. But like anything else, you are going to need a diverse portfolio. You can't just have one primary power production process. You know, there are times where solar just isn't going to work. It's not going to make sense. And so the model on its own, and we did just build out a renewable plus battery storage option on its own and said, all right, well, you know, we know that this will work. The model will pick this up a huge amount of this, um, but it ends up getting really expensive that you basically have to so overbuild the system for that last 10 ish percent of the uh, of the hours ahead of the year um, for when you have multiple dark cloudy days that it doesn't end up really making a lot of economic sense. And so we looked at, well, what are the other power production options for when the doesn't make sense to be dispatching solar and short duration batteries? You know, what else can we be doing? Um, I'm going to be skipping over a lot of detail for the purposes of this because I'm trying to get into the hydrogen, but just know that we did a lot of assumptions. We tried to you know do some real kind of best guesses here. But we did look at, well, what are the options or a new term of category of power production that we call clean firm power options, which basically means power that is available whenever you want it for however long you need it. Um, we looked at a variety of these clean firm power options and we did a generic clean fuel as one of them, hydrogen sort of being what was in our head, um, knowing that uh, there could be some renewable natural gas or some other generic clean fuels that had no carbon emissions attached to it as well. Um, but we basically set the price at sort of where we thought the price of hydrogen was going to be at. Um, and all the pricing and all the modeling, everything else was sort of the generic. Uh, it was all based on commercially available data. As the price comes down, things will get picked up differently because they are economic dispatch models. Um, the good news is coming out of that. When you do a cost comparison of a clean firm power option, any one of the clean firm power options, whether it be clean fuels or imported nuclear or more use of uh, abatement technologies like CCUS, um, any one of the clean firm power options could help contain costs on the electric grid to where they're at today from a generation and transmission perspective. And that's even with the doubling of 
the, the load and everything else that I was talking about at the beginning of this. And if you start mixing and matching uh, the clean firm power options with each other, costs get contained even more. And that makes sense. A more diverse portfolio, you end up picking up the things exactly when you need it and where you need it. And therefore, you can help contain cost a little bit more. And so one of the key takeaways from that modeling exercise for us was it is possible to decarbonize the grid. It's possible to be using clean firm power as an option to help keep a decarbonized grid affordable and reliable. And so then we have to be thinking through what are the policy implications? What are the choices that we have to most be thinking about? Uh, the first one is any one of these clean firm power options on a per megawatt basis are going to be a little bit more expensive, but the overall system cost perspective is going to be contained. And so you have to be evaluating in a regulatory environment uh, both total system cost and project cost as you know, as key metrics here. Uh, if you just kept on doing the cheapest thing possible, the whole thing was not going to stack up to being the most affordable thing. You have to look at a total system cost perspective. Uh, the, the other implication, and this is uh, work that's being done in partnership with Clean Air Task Force right now, is if affordability is something that can be solved for if you start looking at the right metrics here, uh, well, how do you help also influence what is the right mixture of the power uh, output? And that ends up looking at things that are other major constraints on the system. How much land is available? You, know, you can't have the infinite amounts of land for solar production. Um, and hydrogen is an interesting solution within that because it doesn't require a whole lot of land use. Uh, how much transmission capacity is available? How, what are your permitting restraints? And again, hydrogen sort of plays some interesting roles in both of those as well, that uh, hydrogen does have a natural storage capability. And so you might be able to defer some major transmission build outs. Same thing with some of the permitting issues, depending on how the power production process itself is used. Um, I think the moral of the story from a power production perspective is hydrogen itself is going to take a lot of power to make. And so there is sort of a larger parasitic load that's attached to it. So you're going to want to make it with clean power in order to you know, be able to say, yes, we're doing this with a renewable uh, a benefit attached to it or a carbon benefit attached to it, excuse me. And so knowing that it, it's sort of looking at, well, what are the times that you can be making hydrogen where you have excess renewables on the system? And then can you use that power production process and shift it over to make more electricity at times when that renewable production process is not going to be as widely available. And how do those things sort of fit together? The models will solve, so you can do this, but it is sort of a power dense molecule to make. So you need to do it in sort of a smart way that's out there. Um, it's a long answer to a simple question, but I hope folks <laughs> are interested in this. It's extremely helpful, and I think one of the one of the ways in which this is really beneficial for those who are joining us today is that you know we're we're going to be hearing a bit more about you know the thought that's gone into it from a New York perspective as well, sort of digging into the numbers on what modeling you know what the potential opportunities in New York are, and so I, I definitely want to make sure that we're dovetailing to you know the the session that my colleagues will be speaking on in just a minute. But before we do that, I think there's a couple of sort of logical questions I just want to hit with you, Michael, while we still have you. Um, sure. The first one, you know. We, we hear a lot about cost as a challenge, and I, I'm curious to sort of uh, hear about, you know, maybe some of the other challenges or opportunities, um, one of which, you know, noting the work that a couple of your colleagues are doing um, at the Environmental Defense Fund pertaining to hydrogen leakage. Um, and, you know, as you start thinking about increased opportunities and role for hydrogen, you sort of have to be thinking about, you know, the, the obstacles to that build out. I'm curious if you can sort of speak to maybe some of that work and tee it up um, as a, an appetizer for us to go read your colleagues' work. Um, and sort of what the findings are there. Of course, and I uh, in particular need to shout out three individuals, uh, our chief scientist, Steve Hamburg, uh, Alyssa Oko, who's one of our senior scientists, and Tiani Sun. And the three of them have really plowed some new ground here on hydrogen and hydrogen leakage. Um, Ian has put in his slides a link to both their paper and a, and a blog that explains this. Um, and so I am uh, just, Every time I hear them talk about this topic, I walk away more impressed and more inspired. Um, so hydrogen itself, um, as he noted, it's the smallest molecule out there. It's just that it's two atoms bonded together. It's the uh, smallest uh, thing uh, possible to create. 
which means it's also a very slippery molecule. Now, hydrogen is not new. We make it, we use it um, all the time. And we think about hydrogen right now from a leakage perspective, from a safety perspective. And that's important, obviously. Safety is always a priority. But from a safety perspective, we measure hydrogen at a uh, parts per million level basis. But hydrogen itself does function as an indirect greenhouse gas. There is a warming effect when hydrogen is leaked into the atmosphere. It sort of uh, kick starts other processes to create a warming effect. It acts like a short-lived climate pollutant. Um, and so from that perspective, one of the things that our paper talks about is um, if you are building new permitted infrastructure, you have to start building to contain hydrogen, not from just a safety perspective, but from a climate perspective. And that means the level of granularity that is going to be required is not at the parts per million level, but at a parts per billion level. So an order of magnitude more refined. And that's sort of the level of, uh, of granularity that you are going to need to ensure that you are not causing climate harm. Um, I believe that later in the day, you're gonna be talking about this more specifically but hydrogen leakage can occur at every step of the process from the production to the compression, to the storage, to the transport, to the end use. And so you need to monitor hydrogen leakage at every one of those steps along the chain. And from our initial estimates, and it sort of depends on some of the assumptions that the paper will go into, I, I will spare you all some of the details here. If we are talking about green hydrogen, and uh, green hydrogen is sort of, as I define it, made with renewables and sort of from a, a, a sustainable feedstock. Um, there can be dramatic climate benefit compared to today's baseline. It's not going to be a complete elimination of carbon emissions. There's always going to be some amount of leakage. There's no such thing as a 100% tight system. But there can be significant climate benefit if you were using green hydrogen that's sort of there and you have a relatively small leak rate. But if you're using um, a gray hydrogen or a blue hydrogen, you know, there's sort of embedded carbon that is attached to that from the production process, the numbers end up looking a lot worse very quickly with, again, even a relatively moderate, you know, modest leak rate, excuse me, um, you could end up undoing most of the climate benefit that you would want to claim on paper. And so, one of the kind of large uh, uh, rallying calls is think about hydrogen leakage as you are going through your deployment strategies of this fuel from a planning perspective. Um, a couple of the implications for us here in California um, as we look at that research, I think number one is a really strong call for green hydrogen as a production resource that the numbers end up getting so much worse and frankly, you could, uh, for the California system, and I think this is true in a lot of other places as well, with, again, a relatively moderate climate uh, leak, um, because hydrogen is such a small molecule, if you were doing things in the existing system as, as, as your baseline, you could end up creating more climate harm than benefit with a hydrogen swap out. So you really need to be thinking about what the end use context is there, and does this uh, fuel substitution make sense? Um, so I think the number one, uh, sort of logical call extension, at least for us and our advocacy is green hydrogen makes the most sense. Um, the second one is green hydrogen makes the most sense for when there are not other good fuels options available. Um, it is so power intensive to make green, uh, any kind of hydrogen, green hydrogen included that if electrification is a readily available option electrify that part of the economy instead. Um, it's going to be much more cost effective and just much easier um, to just electrify and induce as opposed to using electricity to make hydrogen to then you know, do something else. It's just so much more power intensive. It doesn't make sense. Um, so if we are talking about things like swapping out a home electric, you know, home gas dryer to a home electric dryer, that's a cost effective option. It doesn't take a whole lot of new capital to do things like that doesn't make sense. Let's really save the hydrogen for the end uses where they're not good electrification end uses. Um, things like thermal intensive needs, the heavy industry sector, maybe some long range shipping, freight, aviation, 
maybe some power generation is there as well. But for buildings and some of the other end uses of the economy, probably not your first uh, choice of options. Um, the last thing is uh, 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 kind of a policy call that I think uh, we're starting to say here in California that the science is indicating for us is really get your hydrogen measurement as uh, baked in from the beginning. Um, adapting and blending into the existing system, especially for California, it's probably not going to make a whole lot of sense. Um, it's just too small of a molecule. It's going to leak too easily. And so you really want to do this at the design stage. Um, uh, you know, and that's just sort of a material science issue. Um, and you're going to want to verify that uh, design stage with proper measurement. And so is states um, or planning organizations like NERSERTA put out there, hey, we need to be measuring hydrogen at the parts per billion level. The measurement technologies, which are sort of theoretical right now, but we know that they're coming under market, we'll see more come under market faster if all the states are starting to say, yes, this is something we're actually going to need. Um, yeah. Well, Michael, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but we are, we are at time and I, I really appreciate it. I'll just note, um, you know, one of the, the things or two of the things, particularly around, you know, these, these end use applications, recognizing that we unfortunately don't have the time to dig into all of them. Um, to our attendees, please, you know, make note when the chat box is open during the facilitation activities to let us know, you know, where you want to see us explore in future sessions. And the other thing, Michael, I don't know that you can commit your coworkers to it, but I know that I want to hear a lot more about the work that they're doing around uh, leakage. Um, you know, I think emissions, whether it's in terms of uh, fugitive, fugitive emissions and leakage, or whether it's in terms of, um, you know, nitrogen oxide, NOx emissions associated with hydrogen combustion, you know, those are, those are things that we really plan on delving into as we go through this series. So, um, please note for your colleagues that we would love to have them as part of future programming. And Michael, my sincere thank you for, again, giving us some time this morning. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for, for joining us. Of course, and uh, I'll put it into the chat as well, but my email address is mcolvin at edf.org, and so feel free to reach out to me about anything that I've talked about today. Thank you all so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Michael. And Jason, it's uh, all yours. Thank you, Michael and Ian. We're going to move uh, directly to our next session here, um, where we're going to be hearing from uh, two folks I'll introduce and then hand it over quite quickly. Uh, so the first will be, um, it'll, it'll be a shared presentation here from James Wilcox uh, and Kevin Steinberger with E3. James is a senior project manager for modeling uh, and anal analytics at NYSERDA's energy and environmental analysis team. Uh, James provides uh, instrumental analytical support in the development of the Climate Action Council scoping plan and helped to drive the integration analysis study, which assessed economy-wide benefits, costs, and greenhouse gas emission reductions associated with pathways that achieve the Climate Act greenhouse gas emission limits and carbon neutrality goals. I will also be hearing from uh, Kevin Steinberger with E3, who they'll be co-presenting here. Um, and uh, Kevin joined E3 in 2018 as a member of their planning group. He helps utilities and state agencies plan for low carbon grid uh, and analyzes how different policies and business models affect clean energy development. Uh, he also works with E3's distributed energy resources group, supporting rate design and helping utilities evaluate opportunities for customers to employ distributed energy resources. Kevin has been involved in a pair of key projects pertaining to NARC's decarbonization goals and planning, uh, which include analyzing the feasibility, timing, and costs associated with uh, the New York electric sector targets under the Climate Act, and also managing an assessment of pathways for New York City government to meet the requirements of local law 97. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to James and Kevin, who I think will also be uh, indirectly covering a couple of the questions you've already seen in the Q&A, and we'll make sure to weave those into uh, the conversation as well, so please keep those coming. James, Kevin, take it away. Great, thanks, Jason. And could I get a thumbs up just to let you know that uh, you can hear me? Thank you so much. Um, and I also thank uh, Kevin from E3. Thank you for uh, for co-presenting uh, this, this session with me. And I'll I'll say at the outset, Kevin will be doing taking the hard parts. Um, you know, I'll be starting us off um, with an overview um, of the analysis that we we conducted for the Climate Act. I'll be going at lightning speed uh, to kind of walk through a handful of slides that provide that background context, and then I'll pass it over to Kevin um, to talk uh, more specifically about the specific dimensions um, of the role of hydrogen in that analysis. Um, so I won't. Labor this, but uh, for uh, this uh, slide shows our key targets uh, that were established in the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, uh, aka the CLCPA or the Climate Act. Uh, you'll hear different uh, different names over the course of, of the day, probably. Um, but this uh, 
this act um, established nation leading commitments to climate justice in New York State, um, codifies key greenhouse gas emission reduction goals, including limits on statewide greenhouse gas emissions in 2030 and 2050, uh, along with our end goal of carbon, uh, carbon neutral economy by, by mid century. Um, it establishes uh, our electricity sector targets of 70% 70, 70 renewable by 2030 and a zero emission grid by 2040, which as others have noted, serves as the backbone of our economy-wide decarbonization. Um, and it also sets specific uh, resource targets, um, and we've even seen some increased ambition um, in some of those targets uh, in distributed uh, solar and, and uh, storage. Um, next slide, please. So when we talk about the, the Climate Act and its scoping plan, um, as well as the analysis we conducted for it, um, you know, there's a specific process um, that has been, that the state has been going through um, around developing that scoping plan. Uh, the Climate Act established a Climate Action Council who developed and published a draft scoping plan at the end of 2021. Um, that plan was informed by recommendations provided by numerous uh, topical advisory groups um, and key working groups. Those recommendations form the basis for our integration analysis scenario modeling um, of scenarios that achieve the greenhouse gas emission limits and the goals of the Climate Act. Um, and that analysis also incorporated uh, the greenhouse gas emissions accounting framework required by the scoping, or, sorry, required by the, uh, by the Climate Act, uh, which includes uh, in our accounting of, state, of statewide emissions in New York, uh, upstream out of state emissions from fossil fuels. And it also incorporates a 20 year global warming potential, um, which increases the contribution of short lived climate pollutants like methane. And the draft scoping plan is now out for public comment. Uh, the leadership team has been traveling to public hearings and presenting uh, all over the state. Um, and we've received uh, thousands of comments um, submitted to date. So we're happy to kind of drop a link to the, uh, to the Climate Act website where you can find uh, more details on the scoping plan and the analysis that we conducted for it. So just really briefly, this slide kind of illustrates the distribution of greenhouse gas emissions across New York State's economy um, and illustrates kind of the historical and future trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions um, under the Climate Act emission limits. Uh, you can see here that, you know, building, transportation, power, generation, and waste are kind of our key four top sectors, but there are also um, uh, kind of key uh, emissions that we need to mitigate um, in refrigerants um, and agriculture. Um, and, and in industry, including uh, the gas industry in New York State. So when we conducted our analysis, uh, we started from uh, the foundational uh, recommendations and themes that were provided by, by our advisory panels. So when we look at these scenarios, there are common features across all of the decarbonization pathways we assessed. Uh, these include expansion of transit and reduction of overall vehicle miles of travel, uh, rapid and widespread end use electrification and efficiency, methane emissions mitigations across all sectors and high electric load flexibility um, across uh, sectors and, and the end use categories. Uh, the scenarios that we looked at, we looked at three mitigation scenarios, they diverged in a couple of key ways. Um, so mainly in their incorporation of different worldviews as well as looking at different risk factors. So we developed a scenario two, which looks at strategic use of low carbon fuels, including bioenergy and green hydrogen. Scenario three looks at an accelerated transition away from all forms of combustion, you know, both fossil bioenergy and bioenergy and uh, hydrogen combustion. So we see lower use of bioenergy, lower use of hydrogen, and the hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen that we do see, uh, we see it directed away uh, from combustion applications. And our scenario four looks at going beyond the 2050 greenhouse gas emission limit to see what kinds of ambition it would take to avoid the need to rely on technical CO2 sequestration from direct air capture. So when we render these scenario definitions visually, it looks something like this, where the horizontal bars represent the level of transformation in each of the decarbonization measure categories uh, in these rows over to the left, um, applied to the scenarios in the vertical columns. So you can see that the levels of transformation in these scenarios toggle between low, medium, and high uh, based on the scenario definitions that we just walked through. So very briefly, since this was a benefit cost analysis, just to kind of highlight the top line benefits, um, when we look at the benefits and costs of these scenarios, we find substantial benefits on the order of 400 billion on a net present value basis between 2020 and 2050 from avoided greenhouse gas emissions and public health benefits of avoided co-pollutant emissions relative to a cost on the order of 300 billion for a net benefit of more than 90 billion um, over the study period. So I'll pass it off to Kevin uh, right after this slide 
Um, but to drill down into one relevant metric that starts to unpack uh, the contribution of hydrogen as well as other, uh, other fuels, um, we're looking here at final energy demand shown here on an absolute basis on the left and a percentage basis on the right. Um, and in this illustrative decarbonization scenario, scenario two in this case, we can observe kind of three key points. So one, we see dramatic economy-wide energy efficiency on the order of 50% reduction by 2050. Uh, from energy efficiency measures and the inherent um, energy efficiency benefits of electrification. Uh, we see substantial growth in electricity demand on an absolute basis and as a share of total growing to nearly 70% um, of total final energy demand by 2050. And relevant to our discussion today, we see the purple area on the top of each uh, representing hydrogen uh, growing to 11% of final energy demand by 2050. Um, and so with that, I'll pass the deck to Kevin uh, to unpack kind of what we're, where that uh, demand's being used and how it's being uh, provided. Thanks, James. Um, so if we go to the, the next slide, we can see some of the end uses that we focused on in uh, the integration analysis and where we thought hydrogen could could play a key role. Um, and so, at minimum, hydrogen can play an important role as a zero carbon fuel to support the decarbonization of hard to electrify sectors and applications. In the near term, initial applications could include medium and heavy duty vehicles, as well as high temperature industrial applications. And spurring market adoption in those sectors uh, can also help provide initial scaling for the hydrogen industry in New York. In the longer term, hydrogen could be used in district heating systems, non road transportation like marine and rail, as well as power generation. And over the next few slides, I'll first speak to uh, hydrogen production and um, its impacts on the demand side of the equation in the electricity sector. And then I'll spend a bit of time also speaking about the role of hydrogen in the supply side uh, as a key uh, potential reliability resource in the electric sector. So this, this chart on the right provides an overview of potential hydrogen production methods. This is not intended to be comprehensive and I think we'll hear a lot more detail on each of these production methods in later on in today's session, but uh, I think the, the key takeaway here is that several hydrogen production methods involve the utilization of fossil fuels and so are not uh, zero emissions hydrogen production methods. And as a result, we, in the integration analysis, deemed those to be inconsistent with the achievement of the, the Climate Act requirements. And so we focused on zero emissions hydrogen production and specifically we focused on green hydrogen or the production of hydrogen using renewable electricity to power electrolysis. As a baseline assumption, the integration analysis assumed that 50% of that electrolysis load or that uh, load to produce hydrogen was met with in-state wind and solar and 50% of that was uh, met with out-of-state renewable resources. As a result of producing 50% of that electrolysis load in state, we find that electrolysis can be a significant contributor to total uh, statewide demand. As a point of reference for this chart on the bottom, New York's electricity demand today is about 150,000 gigawatt hours. And so in each of our mitigation scenarios shown here, uh, we are projecting a more than doubling of electricity demand relative to today's levels by 2050. In scenario two, which is our highest hydrogen demand scenario, we find that electrolysis can add over 40,000 gigawatt hours or over 10% of statewide loads in 2050. There are some unique characteristics of that electrolysis load and, and we think that it will be highly flexible as a uh, fuel production end use. Uh, so we are assuming that the, these loads won't contribute to system peaks and can actively be shifted away from uh, constrained times of the day as well as potentially constrained weeks or, or seasons and can be a, a flexible load resource on the system. While we do model these electrolysis loads as highly flexible, and we think that uh, in part they can absorb uh, excess renewables or renewable power that would have otherwise been curtailed, we also find that additional dedicated renewable resources are likely 
to power electrolysis at the scale that we have in, in our integration analysis scenarios. Give a sense of the, the order of magnitude of the resources needed to power these electrolysis loads. We also examined a sensitivity where New York produced, New York met 100% of its uh, electrolysis loads with in state renewables. And we found that doing so, uh, so effectively adding another 40,000 gigawatt hours to, to statewide demand in scenario two, uh, we found that. Doing so and meeting that additional load would require an additional build out of nearly 15 gigawatts of new solar resources and over two gigawatts of land based wind resources. So that provides uh, an order of magnitude estimate of, of the amount of resources that are required to power these, these electrolysis loads. I'll now turn to uh, the supply side of the equation in the power sector and speak to the role that we can we think that hydrogen could potentially play as a long duration storage medium uh, and as a contributor to maintaining system reliability. Um, so first, I'll just orient us to the the portfolios that were built out in our integration analysis scenarios to uh, meet both growing electricity demand as a result of the electrification of buildings, heating, and, and transportation, um, as well as to meet New York's uh, zero emissions limits. Um, we find that there's a significant expansion of the foundational resources of wind, solar, and battery storage across all mitigation scenarios. Um, so we uh, see offshore wind built out on the order of uh, 16 to 19 gigawatts, over 15 gigawatts of land-based wind, over 60 gigawatts of uh, solar resources, as well as on the order of 20 gigawatts of battery storage resources. We also find that between 20 and 25 gigawatts of firm dispatchable capacity is needed to, to maintain reliability and specifically to meet multi-day reliability needs. And I'll go into a bit more detail in, in a moment on um, what exactly those reliability needs look like. If we move to the next slide, we can see the generation mix across all these scenarios. We find that uh, wind, hydro, and solar provide between 90 and 95% of uh, New York's generation, and that these zero carbon firm resources are utilized at a relatively low level over the course of the year. Um, and, and we expect those resources to run at, at low capacity factors. And we can next, on the next slide, zoom in on the, the system operations and what that reliability need looks like. Um, so first I'll, I'll focus on a, a spring week. And if we look at the, the chart on the bottom, and what's shown here is the average generation in each week of the year. So the, the bottom uh, beige uh, resource is the state's existing zero carbon resources. It's existing nuclear and hydro, um, followed by uh, land-based wind, offshore wind, solar and gold. And then uh, the red is times of excess renewables on the system, and the gray represents uh, weeks of the year where a zero carbon firm resource is needed. Um, and so what we can see in, in this week that we're zooming in on, um, it's a spring week with relatively low loads. And so in addition to the state's existing zero carbon resources, uh, wind and solar can power most of the demand over the course of this entire week. And battery storage can uh, charge during times of excess renewables and discharge to fill the gaps during the nights and evenings um, to supply this entire week with, with renewable power. We also can see that there are times during this week where there are excess renewables beyond what that short duration storage resource, that battery storage is able to, uh, to absorb. And th this represents a time where um, either hydrogen electrolysis or another long duration storage solution 
um, can play an important role in absorbing these excess renewables and uh, providing power during times of, of low renewable output. So we can see the, the arrow on the bottom shift to a, a challenging winter week um, where there is a need for zero carbon firm capacity. Um, and what we find here is that even though there are over 100 gigawatts of renewables on this system, uh, the system is, is undergoing a week where renewable output is, is relatively low. Uh, the short duration battery storage, most of it gets depleted very early on in the week, and there are not times of excess renewables to recharge that, that battery resource. And so this is, is where there's an important role for, for hydrogen or another uh, zero carbon dispatchable resource to help maintain reliability during these types of weeks. Um, and we find that um, you know, this is an important part of the, the reliability equation in reaching a, a zero carbon grid, is having this, this resource that could you know, potentially absorb excess renewables uh, during the spring and fall um, and provide reliable power during multi-day stretches of low renewables output. Um, so this, this is really an, an important potential application of, of hydrogen um, in, in maintaining reliability on the electric system. Uh, and you know, I think I'll wrap up here and, and can turn to, to Q&A on either the, the demand side or the supply side of the equation and, and how hydrogen is, is supporting New York's decarbonization goals. Thank you, Kevin and James, for the awesome presentation here on some of the technical scenario planning. We're actually going to shift to a, a, another presentation here uh, directly um, about some of the New York state related activities for planning in hydrogen, and then we'll um, have some time for Q&A. So we're going to fold it all together. Um, and I just want to encourage participants, please do share any questions that you've got using that Q&A function um, so that we can make sure we're tracking them and figuring out where we can best address those. With that, I'll turn it back to Ian Latimer to share more from uh, New York State and NYSERDA hydrogen activities. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jason. And yeah, Kevin and James, thank you for the, the excellent presentation. Um, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to walk through at a relatively high level a couple of the key supporting programs and activities underway at NYSERDA um, as a way of teeing up some time for Q&A with, uh, with James and Kevin and myself. So next slide, please. And uh, apologies for moving quickly, but I want to make sure we're keeping us on schedule. Um, just spend a couple of moments here. There's a variety of um, early stage uh, forward looking planning activities underway at NYSERDA, uh, including membership in a couple of national consortia like organizations that are helping us to plan around and understand the feasibility of hydrogen's integration um, into our work. Uh, the ones on the top row here are what I will term our road mapping activities designed to you know, produce a set of information and understandings that can allow us to sort of plot a, a path forward for hydrogen in New York State. Um, starting on the left hand side, uh, we are really fortunate to be working directly with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL, uh, a couple of folks we'll be hearing from later in the presentation this afternoon. Um, and the NREL study is designed to compile foundational and baseline information and data around um, the opportunities for hydrogen in New York State. Um, it's going to help us evaluate both production and end use opportunities for clean hydrogen so we can really understand the opportunities in terms of market size um, and you know, the different um, potential applications that may make sense in New York, uh, which we recognize may not look the same in other you know, states and locations around the country. Um, from there, we move to the right with the hydrogen policy options analysis underway with E3. Um, whereby we're looking to catalog and evaluate our hydrogen policy and incentive options, uh, really just sort of get an understanding of, you know, how jurisdictions across the country and across the world are thinking about policies around hydrogen, um, analyze potential impacts and sort of evaluate, um, you know, what we want to see uh, put into place here in New York State so that we can work with our partners that are helping lead the state uh, to make sure that we're pursuing this in a responsible way. Um, the final road mapping activity on the far right there is the hydrogen economic development and supply chain analysis underway with energetics, whereby we're doing a market analysis to understand and examine potential economic opportunities and impacts, including thinking about supply chain development and our uh, workforce development here in the state of New York. Um, looking to assess applications and the skill sets and needs that are required to make sure that we are building a robust industry. 
which not only you know brings new people into the workforce but also looks to you know uh, see some some continuity and transition for our, our workers uh, underway and you know whether it's the fossil industry or already in the clean energy industry here in New York. Um, I mentioned earlier there's a membership in two consortia like groups that are you know helping us to understand and uh, evaluate our path forward here in New York. On the bottom left, uh, we're a member of the Center for Hydrogen Safety, which is a national, actually maybe a global nonprofit, um, which is looking to aggregate best practices and resources for jurisdictions pertaining to hydrogen safety. Um, one of the key pieces with the Center for Hydrogen Safety is the ability for us to access the members of a hydrogen safety panel uh, in terms of both general education, but also for specific project reviews. Uh, as well as getting information and best practices on hydrogen safety. Um, we're actually very fortunate to have the executive director of CHS, Nick Barillo, who's joining us this afternoon to talk hydrogen safety with the group. Um, finally, there's the Highland Collaborative, which is another U.S. Department of Energy funded research consortia um, focused on identifying principles of operation on blending hydrogen into the natural gas distribution network, um, which includes both systems analysis and materials research to understand um, where and how we may be able to use existing resources for hydrogen and sort of give us an understanding of where and how that should fit into New York's plans. Uh, a couple other NYSERDA activities that are going on. Um, the first on the left there is our, our long duration energy storage funding um, through our renewable optimization uh, team here within the innovation group at NYSERDA. Um, they're releasing funding for a variety of long duration energy storage uh, demonstration and product development, um, targeting at least six hours of storage as the baseline there. Um, applicable technologies do include hydrogen, but it's not limited to hydrogen. So also mechanical, thermal, and other energy storage technologies are applicable for that funding. Um, moving to the right there, we are really fortunate to be uh, under an MOU with our colleagues in the Danish Ministry of Energy Climate and, or sorry, Energy Utilities and Climate, um, which is an opportunity for us to collaborate and exchange information on decarbonization solutions, which include hydrogen, as well as their pursuit of carbon capture and utilization, um, energy storage, things like that. Um, so we're very fortunate to be to be working with our colleagues there, which is a great opportunity for you know the infusion of lessons learned from um, you know uh, someone who's further along the hydrogen path than we are. Um, and finally, uh, perhaps most relevant to what we're doing right now, which is stakeholder engagement in education, um, looking to engage with, solicit, and understand perspectives from across the stakeholder landscape in New York and the Northeast region. Um, we're looking to provide programming like that we're doing today, as well as future events and forums that are relevant and responsive to the priorities and interests across the state. Very briefly, just want to highlight that in Governor Hochul's 2022 State of the State, uh, she signaled a commitment to bolstering clean hydrogen in New York, including a few key activities. Uh, the first was announcing, announcing New York's intention to compete for uh, up to around $10 billion in federal funding on hydrogen, including $8 billion for hydrogen hubs, which many of you may be uh, paying attention to and interested in. Um, she also asked that NYSERDA, uh, our colleagues at DPS and DEC, all develop a hydrogen regulatory framework to measure emissions reductions and health benefits that can be associated with hydrogen, as well as the implementation of safety codes and standards to ensure that we are being responsible in our deployment of these technologies. Uh, she also signaled a focus on clean hydrogen fuel cell microgrids, aiming to replace fossil fuel systems while providing re resiliency benefits for our communities. Um, also highlighting the deployment of additional 27 million in innovation funding for hydrogen projects to be administered through competitive solicitations from NYSERDA, as well as a development of a proposal for a clean hydrogen demonstration project specifically focused on district heating and cooling, recognizing one of the more challenging decarbonization um, obstacles in terms of decarbonizing our building stock here in New York. Um, and then finally, there was a general commitment to supporting industry collaboration and the expansion of clean hydrogen firms in New York State. And if we'll go to the next slide, please, I'll just take one moment here. I mentioned the federal opportunities and we really wanna focus here on the hubs. I know that's of interest to a lot of people and we can talk about that a bit more here. Obviously not the focus of today's webinar, but it is uh, relevant to all of these conversations. Um, there's a three key buckets of funding available for hydrogen as part of the infrastructure bill, which was passed last year. The largest piece of which is that $8 billion for the construction of at least four regional hydrogen hubs. Um, when they say hub, they're looking for hydrogen production, consumption, and connective infrastructure um, across the country. And uh, next slide, please, and we'll wrap up here. 
Um, in terms of the work that we're doing, uh, in late March, Governor Hochul announced a multi-state agreement to develop a proposal for a Northeast Regional Hydrogen Hub, noting our collaboration with a few of our states here, uh, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, as we look to collaborate with others in the region as well. Um, we're also partnered with 40 plus, uh, like Doreen said at the top, nearly 50 now early stage partners from across the hydrogen ecosystem who are helping us to understand the feasibility and opportunities for hydrogen here in New York State. Um, and as of late May, I'll note that the, from the DOE, the hydrogen hubs funding opportunity remains outstanding and it's looking likely that it won't be released until later in the summer into early fall. So, unfortunately, I don't have as much information as I would be able to provide, um, but we're, we're really excited to sort of see the directions that's coming out of the DOE and really looking forward to getting our hands on that hydrogen funding opportunity. Um, and with that, I will turn it to Jason. I think we've got a couple more minutes for Q&A here. Hey, thank you, Ian, and thank you to participants for conversation. Um, and uh, to be a little bit more specific here, Megan joined um, the Northeast Regional Office of Earth Justice back in September 2017. Um, Megan's work primarily focuses on climate and energy matters in the Northeast region, including representing community and environmental groups and utility rate cases before the New York Public Service Commission. Uh, Megan's become an expert in gas and electric utility proceedings and has focused their efforts on cutting the use of gas in buildings in New York and other issues related to slashing greenhouse gas emissions from the energy sector. Before joining, joining Earth Justice, Megan and spent five years working in Boston as a public defender. Megan, we're thrilled to have you, and I hope I didn't butcher your introduction there and eager to hear from you here in the, in the conversation. I'm going to take a stab at Josh's here, too, and then I'm sure you two will, will add far more depth here in the conversation. Um, but Josh uh, Berman is a senior attorney with Sierra Club's Environmental Law Program. Um, for the past 10 years, Josh has worked with Sierra Club on energy policy and litigation in the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast, focusing on the electric sector. Um, you represent Sierra Club in numerous clean energy, fossil fuel, and transmission energy efficiency dockets, and you're on the board for the Alliance of Clean Energy in New York. Um, previous roles included time with NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council, working on coal-related and other litigation, uh, and clerking on the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in Virginia. Um, Josh, Megan, Ian, thrilled to have you all together and hope that you'll uh, take great advantage of the shared space here. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Ian to kind of drive things forward. Perfect. Thank you, Jason. And uh, again, Josh, Megan, thank you guys so much for being here. It's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to have you both. Hopefully, uh, audio video is working okay and you guys can hear me. Um, but as Jason said, I'm definitely thrilled to move beyond um, the slides model for this conversation and really just sort of have some back and forth. So I appreciate you guys for joining me in that. Um, and perhaps, Megan, I'll start with you. Um, you know, Earth Justice put out a hydrogen report last year, which I can't count the number of times I've gone back to reference and read through. So I want to say, first off, uh, first and foremost, my thanks to you and your colleagues, uh, Sarah and Sister Sassan, for the work that they have put in here, um, trying to understand and really delve into some of the nuances around hydrogen opportunities, what the guardrails may be, what we should be thinking about when we're thinking about hydrogen. Um, so I'll start with you, if you don't mind, um, calling attention to that 2021 hydrogen report. I know there were a handful of key criteria that Earth Justice thinks that should be front of mind when we're thinking about deploying uh, clean hydrogen solutions. Uh, one of those being, you know, avoiding hydrogen as a solution where there are low cost decarbonization alternatives. Um, I'm curious if you could sort of maybe just give us some context and some thinking from Earth Justice's perspective about developing those criteria and maybe just share with some of those other criteria for, for those who may not, as be, may not be as familiar with the report as I am. Yeah, of course. And just wanna make sure you can hear me all right. I sure can. Yeah. Great. Um, so, yeah, so I think the 1st thing that we're always asking um, when we're looking at um, clean hydrogen is, you know, how hydrogen is actually made. Um, is it made with renewable energy or is it made with fossil fuels? Um, and I think, like, like you said, Ian, green hydrogen can deliver a lot of like meaningful benefits um, in sectors that are very hard to decarbonize. But I think there's a couple of factors or, as you said, criteria that we should consider when we're looking at building up green hydrogen. Um, it's extremely energy inefficient. So a lot of energy is used as well as lost um, when making um, green hydrogen. So I think it's something like 20 to 40 percent of the energy is lost when making it going through um, when you're, you're using the renewable energy, um, which is something that should be considered. Um, when we're also talking about like the cost of hydrogen, it's extremely expensive to make, it's extremely expensive to transport as well as store. And I think um, there was a Bloomberg report last year that said um, 
comparing the cost of green hydrogen to fossil hydrogen, I think green hydrogen is something like $4.50 a kilogram compared to $2 um, a kilogram for fossil like blue or gray hydrogen. Um, hydrogen is also extremely difficult to store and transport, which also makes it um, not necessarily the best option. Um, it's extremely dense. It's highly flammable. Um, it's very potent. It's a very small molecule, so it's very prone to leakage, which could also offset a lot of the climate goals that we have. Um, and there's also other environmental challenges, um, such as this, the amount of water that's used um, to make green hydrogen. Um, and so I think when we are going to be using green hydrogen, we should be only using it in specific areas that are hard to decarbonize, such as um, maritime shipping or aviation or in certain industrial processes or long haul trucks or trains with that could be used for hydrogen fuel cells where it would be difficult to have like a long lasting battery. Um, so that's a kind of a high level um, of some of the concerns and some of the criteria that we're looking at when we're looking at what space should be explored for, for green hydrogen. Great, thank you so much. And uh, turning to turning to Josh, and I think the the Sierra Club, similarly, you know, I think that you guys have a, a lot of nuance in how you're looking at it, recognizing that you know perhaps not all hydrogen opportunities are created equal. I'm curious um, how your your thoughts on that response from Megan. If there's any you know other opportunities that the Sierra Club is particularly excited about or interested in, uh, or concerned about when it comes to hydrogen. Thanks, Ian. And just to confirm, can you hear us? Hear me? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Well, thank, thanks so much for thanks so much for including me in this discussion. I got to hear part of the prior panel, and uh, you know, yeah, this is a great great information, and it's obviously an extremely important topic. I think that uh, Earth Justice did a really nice job in their report laying out some of the relevant criteria. And I guess one thing that I would be inclined to layer onto that is thinking through fully whether or not substitution of hydrogen in a particular use case is really consistent with an approach to full or near full decarbonization. Um, and I think that this, this comes up for me at least um, a lot in the context of hydrogen blending into the gas distribution system. Uh, there's a lot of excitement around the potential to reduce the carbon intensity or the greenhouse gas intensity of uh, the gas that we're burning in our homes through blending hydrogen in some amount. And I guess the thing to me that seems really important, and I think this applies in other contexts as well, is like, you know, have we really fully thought through how do you get, you know, is, is blending hydrogen consistent with actually getting to the really deep decarbonization that we're going to need to see in that sector? Um, and I guess, you know, in particular, the, as I get flagged, there are a lot of cost considerations. And so we want to make sure that if, you know, we're, we're finding the places where hydrogen is not ultimately going to be a dead end. Like, are there other lower zero carbon gases that can be blended with hydrogen that are going to actually get us to the really deep, you know, 85% or greater emission reductions that we're going to need to see from each sector? And I guess just one thing I wanted to flag on the cost side, because I don't know that folks are really thinking about this as much as maybe we should be, but, you know, according to the data from the Pipeline Hazardous Material and Safety Administration, PIMSA, um, there are still over 22,000 miles of steel and cast iron pipes in New York State that are owned by the gas distributed gas companies in the state. And if we're really thinking about hydrogen in any substantial way in that sector, given the embrittlement concerns that we see with, with steel and cast iron pipes, we would need to do a pretty substantial replacement of pipes. And you know, just from recent rate cases, we're looking at, you know, about 1.3 to $8.7 million a mile to replace those pipes. And so the, the magnitude of the cost of potentially trying to use hydrogen in a really substantial way in our gas distribution system, you know, is going to be on the order of $70 billion or more. So, you know, that, that is, <laughs> that's a non-trivial cost that we should be thinking about. If that's something, if that's an investment we want to make, or do we want to put that money towards for example, in, you know, instance, what Megan was suggesting, you know, this is a sector where there are pretty excellent electrification alternatives. So I guess I just wanna, wanted to put that out there. I think we wanna really be thinking about whether there's this, a true deep decarbonization solution that involves hydrogen for each use case we're considering. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Josh. I think that that's really helpful. And I, I think, you know, particularly the, 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 the blending conversation, you know, there's, there's so many pieces to that conversation that I think merit, you know, a full understanding. And I think some of that we'll be able to get later once we're talking a bit more about, you know, storage and delivery and the material concerns when it comes to the, the hydrogen blending piece. So I appreciate you, you bringing that up here. And I, I know that we're excited to, to get into that a bit more. Um, 
you're sort of pivoting a little bit, you know, I think um, one of the places that I'm, I'm curious to, to hear your perspective is around uh, project siting, you know, particularly around, um, you know, infrastructure bill money, uh, DOE, uh, and the legislature is looking to have that money be spent on building things. I mean, I think anytime you talk about building projects, um, you know, there is a climate and an environmental equity and justice consideration that you need to be thinking about when it comes to where and how we're building things. And so I'm curious, um, again, as with any critical infrastructure or large projects, um, you know, perhaps uh, given we just heard from Josh, maybe Megan, we turn it back to you. Um, curious to sort of hear from your perspective how you're thinking about um, any best practices or lessons learned around hydrogen project siting, um, maybe lending from other types of siting that you've been working on. Um, would be curious to hear uh, what that means. How do we think about climate and environmental equity um, when we are going about project siting, things like that? Um, yeah, I, yeah, I think that's a, a great question, Ian, and also just a little tricky um, when we're really trying to make sure to include and be inclusive to community groups, environmental justice groups, or even um, indigenous and tribal groups around wherever the facility will be um, constructed or built. Um, I think some of the things that we have come across that we're really like pondering is, you know, when we're built, when there's the proposed construction, like what is the proximity of other flammable or other toxic materials um, to the proposed facilities? I think that needs to be carefully studied to determine, you know, God forbid, what kind of like catastrophic impact could result from an explosion, even if that explosion is deemed unlikely to occur just because of um, how flammable hydrogen is and just what type of catastrophic impact could cause could 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 happen if there there was an emergency. I think for greenfield projects where there is, you know, no buildings around there, I think we need to really examine the compatibility with um, all the existing uses of the area, such as hunting, fishing, um, recreational activities, wildlife, and really before the project is even, I think, at the siting stage to, to reach out to um, community groups and indigenous groups to hear their concerns, um, find out if there is any middle ground. Um, may, there may be some concessions that need to be made, but I think it's just a matter of making sure that those groups are included at the beginning. Um, and I think, again, when there is siting for these projects, it really should be like fully thought through that this green hydrogen um, facility is needed and that there isn't any other way to decarbonize or um, you know, help solve the solve the the issue that that this facility will be helping because there's also the issue of then transporting the hydrogen, the green hydrogen that that would be made at the facility, or the truck routes and all of those other costs that come from that. So I don't think that there's necessarily like a clear, you know, X Y Z to follow, but those are some of the the, the issues that have come up and that we've tried to work through um, in various like siting proposals that we've been engaged in. That's that's great. Thank you. And, you know, I'll just add from from a setting perspective, you know, I've I've had the privilege of, of doing a fair amount of work with some of our communities and groups across the state, uh, mostly on solar and storage. And I'll I'll note and, you know, turning to Josh with this, that um, I think education specifically around hydrogen is a really key piece, just given the again, you know, when I when I start with the, the hydrogen introduction and you start with like the hows and the what's and the why's, there's so many answers to these questions with hydrogen and so many potential ways that you can use it that I think there's a really a lot to be done in terms of establishing shared understandings of the technology. Um, Josh, I'm curious if, if you have any additional thoughts on from a siting perspective and beyond that, um, I'm curious for your perspective, you know, I know um, the Sierra Club that uh, education and engagement is a really big part of what you guys do. And I'm curious um, what you've seen from an engagement perspective or what you would recommend perhaps for the project developers in the room or for us that work here, you know, in the state um, in terms of engaging and educating our communities um, to make sure that they're able to participate in a way that, you know, gives them uh, make sure that they're on even footing, I guess, for the conversation. Thanks, Ian. Um, so I guess I like, just on the Citing issue, I would like to pick up on one of the points Megan was making about the transport. Um, you know, I think as we're, <laughs> it relates to the education piece as well, but as we are learning more about hydrogen, the properties of hydrogen and how it interacts with other gases in the atmosphere and what the broader implications of hydrogen are, 
I think we're learning that hydrogen leakage is a particularly acute concern. Uh, there's a paper that's in development by some scientists at Environmental Defense Fund that is looking at the 10 and 20 year global warming potential of hydrogen and finding that, again, because hydrogen is so reactive in the atmosphere, uh, the 10 and 20 year global warming potential of hydrogen is extremely high um, on the order of 10 year, on the order of 34 to 66 times that of carbon dioxide. So, you know, I think one of the things that I guess would flag in addition to the points Megan made or kind of complement the points Megan made is that we really do need to be thinking about if there's going to be a substantial transport of hydrogen component to the project, how are we ensuring that we are really minimizing any leakage because, as Megan noted earlier, hydrogen is extremely leakable. And we certainly, in addition to the combustion impact of hydrogen with nitrogen oxides, you know, we really need to be careful about the global warming potential of any hydrogen leakage. Um, in terms of the education piece, I think, you know, I guess, you know, when I, when I was thinking about this question, I think like, it's fair to say that there is still a lot that we are learning about hydrogen uh, based on, you know, just flagging the, the new research from Environmental Defense Fund on the global warming potential. Similarly, you know, from conversations that I've been involved in with uh, turbine manufacturers like Mitsubishi, you know, I think it's still unknown exactly how low we're going to be able to get nitrogen oxide emissions. And I think from the perspective of Sierra Club and from the perspective of communities that may be in proximity to hydrogen facilities, obviously, you know, ensuring that we're able to get nitrogen oxide emissions from hydrogen combustion as low as possible and ideally hopefully lower than we're able to get from, from conventional gas plants is going to be quite critical. Um, in terms of advice to developers, you know, just briefly, I would say, you know, like Megan said, engaging the community as early as possible and in as genuine a way as possible, I think is absolutely essential. Um, you know, I think the way I've intersected with this has mostly been around um, proposed gas plants where there's been this possibility that they would convert to hydrogen. Um, and, you know, I think often the, the choice that's been presented to communities, I know this is a little, little answer to the point that Ian was asking about, but the, the choice that's been presented to communities has typically been, do you want the current dirty fossil fuel plant that you've been living with for decades, or would you like a new state-of-the-art plant that might burn hydrogen in the future? And the response from communities, at least in my experience, has typically been, we don't really want either of those things, and we should be creative about thinking about whether there are uh, alternative combinations of renewables and storage and demand response and energy efficiency and transmission upgrades that can obviate the need. I know that applies only specifically to the uh, you know, power sector, but, you know, again, I think, you know, it is really important to be listening to the community and seeing if there are ways to actually hear and understand what their concerns are and seeing if there are ways to address those. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, super, super helpful. And I, I think, you know, part of part of how we're thinking about it, too, is uh, not reinventing the wheel for, for hydrogen and like models for education and outreach. Um, you know, if there are lessons that can be learned and best practices that can be shared from, you know, places like uh, we were fortunate to have Michael from Michael Colvin from EDF on earlier this morning, giving us a bit of the California perspective. And so being able to learn from, you know, places where those projects are already either having been built or gone through more advanced stages of permitting and development, I think is, is really helpful there as well. Um, Maybe Josh, we'll, we'll stick with you here. I think one of the other questions I would sort of love to think through, um, you know, there's a lot of work being done in New York State and at the federal level right now pertaining to um, defining and allocating benefits to disadvantaged communities. Um, so in New York, we've, you know, as part of the Climate Act passed in 2019, uh, was we, we've tasked, uh, you know, the state with coming up with a definition of disadvantaged communities by which we can track and allocate benefits of all of our spending. Um, similar initiatives happening uh, at the Department of Energy and the federal government through the Justice 40 initiative. Um, I'm curious just to sort of get an understanding about thinking about harm reduction and disadvantaged community benefits within the hydrogen space. I'm curious if there's any potential applications or types of projects that you've seen where, you know, potentially that's really where the, the focus should be in terms of our allocation of benefits to disadvantaged communities. Um, just curious if that's something that, that the Sierra Club has been thinking about or engaging with. That's a, that's a great question, Ian, and I have to say, I gave some thought to that question in advance of this panel because you flagged it, but I, to, be, to be perfectly candid, you know, I, I don't know that I have really seen a lot of enthusiasm about hydrogen from the communities that Sierra Club has been particularly engaged with, and so I don't know how to, right, again, you know, I think Sierra Club is really trying to honor the HEMES principles and really think about, you know, how to, like, let communities speak for themselves, how to you know, really try to like kind of like amplify, but not, you know, it, it, it dictates to communities how, like how they should be approaching this issue. And, you know, again, when, when they're, you know, I guess kind of maybe circling back then to your education point, I mean, you know, th there may be, there may be misunderstandings and reasons that are not completely rooted in, um, you know, in, in hard, in hard details that, that may be able to like kind of break through some of these concerns. But 
you know, I, I, I would flag it, you know, it, I'm not sure, right, I haven't yet to see, like, you know, real enthusiasm about communities saying embracing hydrogen as a path forward to either reducing emissions or creating jobs for communities. So, again, I'd be really interested, I mean, if Megan works in more and greater, you know, other communities, so I'd be interested if she has a different perspective on this, but I guess I, I didn't have a really good answer to that question from what I've seen. Yeah, and maybe Megan, before before I pivot to you on that, you know, I think one of the one of the places where I'm particularly interested to see the benefit, you know, we've we've had the privilege of having some some great conversations with some of our environmental justice leaders, um, the community group leaders, and I think that, um, you know, the the amount of the the conversation around hydrogen that really focuses on a couple of specific applications, I think, really, uh, I don't want to say colors the conversation, but I think you know, one of the places that we're looking is around. You know, transportation and potentially opportunities for alleviating, you know, pollution from transportation, um, particularly around like long distance transport hubs and places like that. Um, airports, ports, things like that are, are places where I'm, I'm particularly thinking about, you know, emissions reductions as a potential opportunity, but recognizing that it's hard to get to that conversation when there are, you know, the, the loudest and largest projects that we've seen proposed or maybe ones that are, you know, not projects that a, a community would look fondly upon. Um, so, Megan, I'm curious for, for your perspective as Joss was sort of pitching. I'm curious how you guys are thinking about it from an environmental justice um, disadvantaged community benefits framework um, or, yeah, make of that yeah. what you know. Um, thanks. I think in, in some ways we're, we're pretty similar to Josh where a lot of the cases that we have been engaged in have been our clients in environmental justice or disadvantaged communities where they have been opposing new plants coming, being constructed, or even repowering with the idea of having hydrogen come in and replace the fossil fuels. Um, I think there's a lot of concern with that actually being a real solution. And if it's, there's still going to be combustion, if there's still going to be um, public health concerns. Um, but I was thinking, um, you know, today, I think not necessarily in New York, but some of our colleagues in New Jersey have been doing a lot of work in Newark around the ports, as well as some of our colleagues out in California um, in Long Beach, where there's um, large amounts of pollution around the, obviously the ports. And if that could be an area, like I said earlier, of, of various sectors where it is hard to decarbonize, and that could be a space where we could educate, um, work collaboratively, and there'd be a lot of inclusivity so that um, the communities that would be most impacted um, if there was this infrastructure um, brought in, that, 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 they would, that there would be buy-in. Um, you know, I think vessels and, um, I mean, the airports around LAX as well as Long Beach um, contribute to massive amounts of pollution and if there could be fuel cells replaced instead of the fossil fuels, I think that there could be, that could be a possibility um, for a solution. I don't know if we fully thought that through, but I think that's the space where we would want to explore, um, as mm -hmm. assuming we, um, our partners and the groups that would be like, the frontline groups would be um, on board with us. And, and speaking of that, I think that that dovetails to a really important part of, of the conversation that I want to note, which is that, you know, it's one thing for these conversations to happen in Zooms like this in the middle of a work day. Uh, in terms of expanding that conversation to, you know, include community members, and I think we can we can wrap with this question. Um, I would just maybe, maybe again, sort of give you guys a platform to talk to, you know, some of the, the project developers and other industry folks, as well as the state folks that are on the call today. Um, you know, any suggestions or thoughts about what it could look like in terms of exploring and evaluating the hydrogen space and bringing those conversations to our community groups and to our community members to make sure that, you know, we are not speaking on behalf of people and people whose perspectives we don't fully understand. You know, what does it mean to sort of make room for that uh, in this conversation? Uh, we'll be curious for your thoughts, and then I think we'll be going to the break after that. So thank you. Uh, Josh, did you want to go? Josh, to yeah, Josh, that? you want to start with that? Sure. I don't know if I can hit all of those excellent points in, but I guess the thing, I guess the thing I wanted to flag, because the thing that I am most excited about um, in hydrogen space has really been, you know, I, I, I think there is likely to be increasingly large amount of renewable curtailment in the future. I know the prior panel was putting some, some good hard numbers around this, but, you know, I think we're going to see a lot of that. And I think figuring out whether, you know, is hydrogen, but what is the best medium for storing that energy on a seasonal basis so that we really have, you know, a large energy source that we can draw from 
um, during the times like, for instance, those like, you know, cold winter weeks that were identified in that last panel where we can really draw on that. And, but then combining that with how, how do we use hydrogen's best option, right? The, the, the use cases that are the most attractive, right, are the ones where we're not combusting it, but we're actually reacting in the fuel cell and generating zero emissions, right? And so, you know, how, how do we marry those two? I, I, I'm not a scientist. I, I don't know. But that to me is the exciting, exciting cutting edge place where can we find a way to use, you know, is hydrogen, if hydrogen is the answer, how, how do we store that hydrogen on a long-term basis and then use it when we need it, but and ideally react it in a fuel cell so that we are actually have a really excellent dispatchable, you know, long duration storage resource that we can, we can activate when we need it. So I, I you know, again, that doesn't get at the community piece. And I, again, I, I, from my experience, I don't know that I have a ton of insight into, how, you know, but I think if we can, if we can identify a zero emission, truly zero emission solution that dovetails nicely with existing plan build out of renewables in the state, like that to me seems like kind of the holy grail. So wanted to at least put that out there. She was making a good answer. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, I would agree and echo what Josh said and maybe just add um, that, you know, developers by reaching out and educating with communities and, front, and frontline groups, you know, talking about employment or job opportunities or apprenticeship um, programs so that but I mean, some of the benefits, not only pollution and climate change impacts will, you know, make their air cleaner to breathe, but that these jobs are sustainable. Um, clean energy is here as we expand more of our renewable energy and that there's a lot of good paying jobs um, that pay livable wages. Um, and I think that would also, um, I don't want to speak for uh, environmental justice communities, but I would imagine that they would be interested. And in, I think, um, you know, making the time to reach out to talk to groups and also make those meetings that are, are public hearings available at various times, which I know is a lot of like management, but also even maybe be in one or two different languages or at least have some pamphlets in various languages so that groups are not afraid, but they're aware of what's going on and that they can participate in the conversation and learn more from it. That's, that's great. Thank you. Super helpful. And I, I think the sort of final piece I would add just in terms of the workforce development, given the attention on the hydrogen hubs, uh, you know, funding from the, the DOE, that one of the, the pieces that we did learn this week was a bit more about how they're thinking about, you know, environmental and, and climate equity when it comes to looking at hubs and their evaluation criteria. And we know that it is a key part of, you know, their, their choosing to award certain proposals. And so I, I think that, you know, we're all really interested to get the final details on what they're looking at and how they're thinking about, you know, community engagement as a proactive thing for these projects. Um, so I really appreciate your perspective and we look forward to seeing, you know, how that aligns and hopefully we can continue to drive that into our projects. Um, I just want to know we're a couple minutes over, so I want to make sure that we're giving people a break. Uh, Josh, Megan, my sincere thank you guys, both of you for, for joining us this morning. Um, we can bring the screen share back up, uh, John, if you don't mind and move it to the break slide um, to our attendees. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll pass it to Jason to bring us into the break. But again, uh, Josh and Megan, thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the great conversation uh, and discussion. We are, as Ian noted, going to take a break. It's going to be less than 10 minutes, um, just given the volume of questions we've been trying to weave into the conversation. And I hope that uh, everyone will spend the next five minutes standing up or, or moving around if you're able uh, to look away from your computer screen for a moment. Um, and uh, we'll turn uh, to our break and we'll regroup at approximately 11.05, maybe a, maybe a minute or two longer. So talk soon. Thanks, everybody. Good spot. If not, and you need any troubleshooting support, please do reach out uh, to the NYSERDA team. And also just a reminder for folks who've received a, a handful of questions about the recording for today's event and uh, materials. And just wanted to remind folks that they will be available and posted online to NYSERDA's hydrogen page um, as, as available. Um, so next we're gonna move, uh, if we could advance uh, a slide here, um, we're gonna move to a product uh, overview on hydrogen production from Mark. Ruth. Mark uh, is the group manager for industrial systems and the fuels group for NREL's, uh, which is the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, uh, Strategic Energy Analysis Center. Um, and uh, Mark leads analysis uh, projects focused on the interface between energy sectors, including electricity and industry. Mark's been at NREL for 25 years, where we've also been involved in bioenergy, hydrogen, and distributed energy technology concepts and development. 
Um, Mark, it sounds like your current interests include um, the uh, hydrogen at scale concept, which focuses on potential for hydrogen as an interface with inherent storage between electricity and industry and transportation, along with the potential for industrial combined heat and power systems to provide grid support. Um, and then lastly, uh, financial opportunities of tightly coupled nuclear renewable hybrid energy systems. That is a, a wealth of area that I'm sure folds into your presentation here today and just thrilled to pass you the virtual mic here to go through some slides and then we'll we'll have some time for Q&A as well at the tail end. So over to you to talk a little bit more about hydrogen production and uh, the color descriptors and what is clean hydrogen. Thanks, Jason. Can you hear me okay? I sure can. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, thank you everyone for uh, for participating this morning in trying to learn a bit more about hydrogen, hydrogen protection hydrogen technologies and what the opportunities are for them and where there's challenges and uh, issues that that need to be overcome. Uh, as Jason mentioned, I am a group manager at the National Renewable Energy Lab. For those of you who may not be as familiar with the National Renewable Energy Lab, we are a Department of Energy laboratory. Uh, Brookhaven is the closest one to probably most of you being on Long Island. But there are about 17 different national laboratories at this point in time. Uh, some of the big ones, some of the big older ones like Brookhaven and Los Alamos and Oak Ridge and some of the other ones that you have heard of. Uh, we are a smaller one at only about 3,000 staff. Um, and we are the only one that is very focused on uh, renewable and energy efficiency technologies. That is the essentially the total of our focus is, is in that space. Uh, and so we, we spend a lot of time thinking about these issues and working to try to develop these technologies. Thanks. So in my uh, short slide deck that I'm going to spend with you, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on hydrogen and hydrogen technologies and where it is in the United States. And then I'll move into the H2 at scale concept, give you a little bit of background on what we have done and why we're thinking about that. Move then into hydrogen production technologies and their carbon intensities, getting into the colors of hydrogen and some Department of Energy targets and funding. So as a background, uh, hydrogen is, as, as many of you know, but I want to kind of or kind of uh, baseline everybody. Hydrogen is the smallest and simplest element. It has an atomic number of one. It's the upper left-hand corner of the periodic table, and is the is the most abundant element in the universe. In fact, most, in fact, uh, our energy, the dominant production of our energy is hydrogen fusion to be able to produce helium, and that generates the energy in stars, including our sun. So originally, all of our energy comes from hydrogen. But, and, and there's, as you can see, a lot of hydrogen within the universe, but most of it is not a form that we can really get to. In fact, it's in a relatively low, atom, a low energy state. In fact, on Earth, most hydrogen atoms are con contained in more complex molecules. So you can see in the bottom left here, a water molecule with two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen. It's a pretty low energy state. Or on the right-hand side, a glucose molecule, which is the primary monomer in starches and cellulose. So it's a sugar. If you eat potatoes or, or uh, any other starch, pasta, or anything like that, you've got the hydrogen molecules in there, the, the whitish colored molecules in each one of them. So the energy, the bonds between those atoms are really what contains or really how we can get to the hydro, get to the energy that we want to be able to use. Hydrogen was discovered uh, 350 or so years ago when Robert Boyle just produced hydrogen gas, but it wasn't really just realized that it was a distinct element before about 250 years ago when Henry Cavendish was able to separate it. I like to think about hydrogen like electricity. It's an energy carrier with, within our world. In other words, you don't make hydrogen or you don't have hydrogen to be able to make energy out of, like you do oil or natural gas, but rather you take energy, you produce hydrogen, you get it to the place and the type of utilization that you need, and then you use it in that place. That's very similar to electricity where we don't actually use electricity directly for most things, but we use it as a way of carrying energy from where, where energy sources could be. It's also, it's been discovered, it was discovered many, many years ago, again, over 200 years ago, how to be able to get hydrogen out of water. That was by Michael Faraday. And then, um, and then how to be able to create water in a way that's non-combustive and be able to then get the energy out of it by Sir w William Robert Grove. 
And that led to some really interesting science fiction-y type things led by Jules Verne in The Mysterious Island in about 1880, he wrote that, where they actually had a hydrogen economy and imagined a hydrogen future that would that was run instead of using, in that case, they were thinking about coal. So hydrogen as a technology has been something that's been considered for a very long time. That gives you a little bit of background moving into the next slide. What, where is hydrogen today? And how do we think about hydrogen today? Currently, there's about 10 million metric tons per year of hydrogen that is used in the US today, almost entirely for its, for its chemical purposes, for oil refining, for ammonia production primarily. Um, in other words, we take that those hydrogen molecules and we use it to be able to break down long chain oil, very heavy oil type molecules that can't be used as fuels because they're they're too viscous, but break them down into shorter chains. In addition, we use hydrogen to be able to uh, produce ammonia with nitrogen out of the atmosphere and then use that ammonia for fertilization to be able to produce uh, foods and, and, and other crops. So there's about 10 million metric tons per year of hydrogen today. To give you, put that into context, uh, that it's almost all produced via natural gas. And in context, that requires about two quadrillion BTUs of energy or two quads of energy, which is about 2% of the total energy use in the United States today. So that's a lot of energy. And when we talk about hydrogen in the future, we aren't talking about multiple orders of magnitude, but maybe somewhere around 50 to 100 to maybe 150 million metric tons per year of hydrogen annually. I haven't seen any numbers greater than that for the US. So we're talking about maybe multiplying by one order of magnitude of growth into the future. Hydrogen is heavily used in the US today, as I've mentioned, and that involves a lot of transmission pipelines. In fact, the US has about 1600 miles of hydrogen pipelines right now, including about 40 miles in the in the LA basin, lots of miles around uh, the around the Gulf Coast. That's where probably the majority of that, probably a thousand of that 1600 miles is around the Gulf Coast, moving hydrogen between places where it's generated and where it's used to be able to, uh, as I mentioned, refine oil or produce, uh, produce, ammonia, uh, produce ammonia for fertilizer. So we've got a lot of experience in producing hydrogen from natural gas, and we've got a lot of experience in moving and utilizing hydrogen. The challenge is that it's not it's not carbon emission free today and it's definitely not set up for non-industrial purposes as much today but it's primarily carbon emitting and for industrial purposes. And so there's been a lot of recent interest as as you've noticed and why we're meeting today in uh, in hydrogen. A lot of global drivers. Uh, one of those that has been mentioned is that there's a lot of low cost renewables and those low cost renewables lead to curtailment, which leads to a lot of potential energy that is very, very low cost that could be utilized for other valuable purposes like producing hydrogen for then its, its potential products. So this figure in the middle shows some of the growth. Uh, capacity installed as of 2019 was about 75 megawatts of electro electrolysis. You can see that that grows to 41,300 megawatts or 41.3 gigawatts of electrolysis if all the announced and planned installations uh, appear before 2030. So we're talking a massive growth on the electrolytic hydrogen. The reason why we're seeing that is that there's a lot of value with to be able to utilize though that that those low cost renewables. And there's the opportunity to be able to clean up climate goals by utilizing hydrogen for hard to decarbonize scent sectors like uh, producing ammonia, like um, steel refining, like other places where high temperature combustive heat is required. There's also the opportunity to be able to utilize hydrogen for energy storage, as was mentioned in the previous panel, to be able to utilize these to be able to produce dispatchable energy that can then be utilized for electricity during uh, times of year when uh, when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining as much. Lots of places in the world are looking at import export opportunities. So uh, econ our energy poor areas like Japan that require a lot of energy are looking at importing hydrogen and energy rich areas like Australia are looking at exporting hydrogen. So there's a lot of opportunities showing a lot of hydrogen and this has led to a lot of interest uh, kind of from a financial and economic viewpoint. Next slide, please. And that has led to, over the last five years, uh, a group that has been really focused on developing what we call H2 at scale. This is the H2 at scale figure, as probably most of you already seen, and it's really focused on moving hydrogen uh, into 
into the thinking as an energy carrier for additional chemical uh, an energy carrier, as I mentioned before, and in additional chemical operations. So hydrogen you can produce from a lot of different areas, but with a focus on electricity grid, as you see on the left, at least within the energy efficiency, renewable energy technology areas within DOE, and then be able to use it for everything from hydrogen vehicles for say long distance transportation on the upper right or synthetic fuels with CO2 or upgrading oil for marine and aviation fuels where that uh, and the energy density is so important. Also using it for its chemical purposes, as you see in purple, for ammonia, metals refining, and decarbonizing steel production, which is about 5% of the global uh, CO2 emissions right now, and other end uses. And even heating, where it doesn't make sense to electrify or, other, or use other uh, heat sources because of the heat demands, the, heat, uh, the type of heat demands, or the uh, availability of the energy source for that. So this is the H2 at scale type figure that we are thinking about within DOE, which leads to the next slide, which is the focus of the Department of Energy on how to, on, in research areas. The research areas you see in the middle here are really make, move, use, and store, because DOE is focused on all four of these areas, where make is producing hydrogen with reduced, uh, with, with reduced carbon intensity, using is utilizing hydrogen in a way that makes sense very specifically to very specific demands, and then moving and storing hydrogen is in between, trying to transport and, uh, and make hydrogen available in different areas and different times when hydrogen than when it is easily available. So that gives you a little bit of background on the technology viewpoint. If you move to the next slide, please. A uh, little bit of background on the technology that's available. I'll move more into a focus on production at this point in time. So as you can see here, there are a number of hydrogen production technologies. So there's five of them showed here. Um, but and, there, and there's other additional ones. What we call green hydrogen in many cases is taking green electricity, or in this case you see PV or wind electricity, and running through an electrolyzer, which splits the water molecule into hydrogen and oxygen. That hydrogen can then be stored and transported to where it might be usable. That's green is making it usually, uh, usually what is called green is making it from those renewable sources. Pink hydrogen, or sometimes called purple hydrogen, is making it from nuclear sources instead, but you can see that it's essentially the same process, electrolysis and then storage and pipeline delivery. So-called blue hydrogen, or so-called gray hydrogen on the bottom, is, is taking natural gas, taking the hydrogen out of it, if natural gas is carbon, a carbon atom with four hydrogen, or primarily methane, which is a carbon atom with four hydrogen atoms connected to it, taking the hydrogen off of it, taking more or splitting more water to be able to produce more hydrogen and releasing the carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. You can that you then take that natural gas, you reform it, you store it, and you've got hydrogen out the, at the other end. The difference between gray hydrogen and blue hydrogen in the middle is that when you have the, the reformer, you capture this in blue hydrogen, you capture this carbon dioxide that's produced and you store it in the, uh, in, in the, in the earth with carbon capture and storage. And then there's so-called turquoise hydrogen, which is similar. However, what it does is it, uh, instead of making CO2, it actually goes directly to carbon molecules or carbon black, which can then be utilized for tires and for other carbon purposes. So instead of making that carbon dioxide that then gets stored in the, in the earth, what we're doing is we are making carbon black, which is then injected, which is then utilized for other, per, other uh, industrial purposes that we have um, and, and those kinds of things. But DOE is moving away from the color terminology because it's not really precise and it doesn't really tell you everything that you need to see. So on the next slide, you can see what we have moved to instead within the Department of Energy, which is really life cycle emissions. So we really think about what are the total emissions of hydrogen, uh, or total emissions of CO2 to be able to produce the hydrogen. And those range from a negative number for things like renewable natural gas from, from municipal solid waste, which you see in the middle, across the different colors, and to different areas. And you can see the colors on this slide and each bar on the slide represents different methods of producing hydrogen, a few more than are on the previous slide. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, the gray hydrogen is the currently what's done, which is steam methane reforming or taking natural gas, reforming it, releasing the hydrogen into the atmosphere. 
Its emission profile is somewhere between 9 and about 11 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilogram of hydrogen, which is why it's the highest bar on the left. Uh, those numbers depend upon its steam credits and really depend upon upstream losses of hydrogen or lo upstream losses of the methane. There's a number of different ways of making hydrogen from, say, byproducts, including the core alkali process and steam cracking of, of within refineries. Those you can see run around eight to nine kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of hydrogen. And then we get into what I mentioned as blue hydrogen, which involves carbon capture and sequestration, the gray hydrogen process with carbon capture and sequestration. That gets us down to about three kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of hydrogen depending upon the upstream losses of the methane. Landfill gas reforming is much lower. It's taking the landfill gas, which is primarily, again, methane, reforming it to produce hydrogen, but releasing whatever CO2 is left over to the atmosphere. It's very low because essentially what you're doing is utilizing CO2 and methane that would be, would be, uh, would be emitted to the atmosphere and replacing it with others. Renewable natural gas from MSW is really capturing, doing a great job of capturing it. It gets to negative emissions. Solar and wind hydrogen, uh, which is that green hydrogen that you saw on the previous slide, has essentially no emissions because the, it's, it's going from green electricity to green hydrogen. Pink hydrogen, which is nuclear with either high temperature or low temperature electrolysis, that's the HTE or LTE there, uh, have some emissions, uh, but very, very low because of the very low nuclear emissions. The reason why there is some is because there's uranium mining and some emissions from that. Coal with CCS is very much like the natural sea methane reforming a natural gas with CCS, has very similar emission profile, and biomass gasification, which some will call green hydrogen, is a little bit less than two. And that's where you take that biomass, you break it down like coal, you gasify it, and you get some hydrogen out of it, and you, but you release the CO2 to the atmosphere. So we use these numbers instead. And in fact, if you read the statutes or the Build Back Better Act, the proposed Build Back Better Act, it required a life cycle emission profile of less than two CO2 uh, kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of hydrogen. And we really think about, well, what are those emissions in those, in those generation uh, technologies in those areas? And DOE is doing work across all of these. But a lot of work, and especially a lot of work uh, within the, the electrolysis, which gets us into the solar and wind hydrogen and the nuclear hydrogen. And Brian, will, Brian Pivovar will talk about that after this. Next slide, please. DOE, you may have heard. Oh, well, DOE, as I mentioned, is really looking at, uh, at, at hydrogen from electrolysis. The goal is to get from where we are today, which is around $5 per kilogram, down to $1 per kilogram. If you click it again, please. Uh, down to $1 per kilogram. To be able to do that, we have to achieve both low electricity costs, as you can see upper right, going from $50 per megawatt hour to $20 per megawatt hour. We have to reduce capital costs, and we have to reduce operating and maintenance costs quite a bit. Click it again, please. To be able to do so, um, there's a lot of money that is being put into that by the Department of Energy, including not just the $8 billion for the clean hydrogen hubs, but also $1 billion for electrolysis and related R&D. And again, Brian Pivovar will talk more about that uh, in the subsequent presentation. There's a couple of other areas that you may have heard about that DOE has provided loan guarantees in. One is in methane pyrolysis. Remember, I mentioned this as turquoise hydrogen on a previous slide, and it's essentially taking natural gas in uh, reacting it in a in an oxygen free atmosphere, essentially no oxygen atmosphere, getting carbon black and hydrogen out of it. Monolith uh, Monolith has received a 1.04 billion dollar loan guarantee that they're located in Nebraska, and their carbon black is primarily going to the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. They claim a carbon intensity of 0.45 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of hydrogen, which, as you may remember, is just slightly higher than the uh, than the than the nuclear electrolysis uh, that I showed a couple of slides ago, um, and is really focused in this area, providing that they use renewable electricity to be able to provide their energy for the plasma furnace itself. My final slide shows another loan guarantee. Uh, which is the next slide, which shows another loan guarantee 
which is going to uh, the Advanced Clean Energy Storage Project in Utah. This is really focused on using electrolysis to separate, to break down water into hydrogen for storage, and then be able to store that hydrogen in an underground salt cavern, which you can see in the figure on the right, and then utilize that energy or that hydrogen to be able to produce electricity for the city of Los Angeles using at the Intermountain Power Plant, uh, and be able to convert it from what is now coal through natural gas and to hydrogen uh, in the future. They're right now converting it to a 30% or 70% natural gas, 30% hydrogen mix, and ultimately trying to get to 100% hydrogen, not a technology limitation, but a hydrogen availability limitation is really their driver there. So with that, that, hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea on hydrogen production technologies, and I'll open it up for questions or discussion. Um, I didn't see any in the, in the list, but Jason, if you have others coming in. Yeah, there there were a bunch that came in earlier that I think were sort of signposted along some of the content that you've shared. So I also appreciate where we are with time. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to pick one that I heard a couple of folks comment towards um, as a question, and then we'll move to uh, Brian's presentation, which you've also done a great job planting some some hooks across the the conversations here. Um, so there, there's there have been a number of questions about renewable energy production um, or, or curtailment or use for, for supporting hydrogen production. I'm um, just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about like wh what's the best available knowledge in regards to viability or trajectory to for any curtailed renewables to be a source for producing hydrogen? Uh, that's a great question. So one of the big challenges there is that renewable curtailment becomes a very big deal when you have high penetrations of what we call variable renewable electricity, or essentially think about that as wind or solar photovoltaic solar type electricity. Right now across the US, we don't really have that. We are still at the kind of 10% type range for those technologies. And so because of that, we run our grid by being able to ramp up and down other generation technologies and we don't have to curtail any of it. Now, when we get the 60 or 70% or even 80% uh, of the generation mix being those technologies, then during many hours of the year, we'll be producing more energy than we have demand for. Some of that can be stored in batteries for use overnight or things like that, but some of that would have to be available, would not be usable in that way. However, on the flip side, we also have a seasonal storage demand where there might be weeks or even a month or so of time where the total net load is greater than the gener or the total load is greater than the generation. So you'd want to be able to store something for that. The trick is, or every or one of the thoughts is that hydrogen would be great for that op opportunity and that it can be stored, as you can see here in the ACES project, could be stored for a very long period of time. The challenge is that the electrolyzer wouldn't run very often. In other words, it would only run, say, 20% of the time through the year, which means that its capital cost has to be very, very low to be able to be cost effective. The reason for that is that if you can run 100% of the time, then let's say you're producing 100 million metric tons per year from your, or 100, 100 tons per year from your electrolyzer. But if you only run 20% of the time, then you only produce 20 tons. And if you've got the same capital investment, that return on that capital investment needs to be split amongst only 20 tons. And it requires a lot lower cost to be able to be cost effective. So that's where the R&D is. And that's where Brian will talk about what is being done to be able to get into that space and to be able to make that cost effective. And I'm going to sneak in one more question here, Mark, just directly since, uh, about the advanced clean energy storage project. Um, how long has it been operating? And I see the, the 5,500 tons of hydrogen storage as capacity, but what's the current uh, level? So, so with ACES, so ACES was just a recent loan guarantee. The loan guarantee was actually released uh, maybe four or five months ago in Delta, Utah. What it, it's situated right next to the Intermountain Power Plant, which is currently a coal power plant. They're in the process of converting that over to natural gas and the mixture of natural gas and hydrogen. And with this loan guarantee, they are in the process of engineering and finalizing the design for this salt cavern storage. So right now, there is no, this is still in design and in, uh, const well, they're starting construction. They've broken ground, they're starting construction on, on this technology. It is not in process, it is not in use today. So this is a, a relatively newer, well, it's a new construction. However, I wouldn't say it's a new technology. We currently have three salt cavern storage sites in the Gulf Coast where there are other salt caverns for hydrogen storage 
on some of those Gulf Coast pipelines. However, they aren't being used for electricity production. Instead, they're being used for hydrogen, for fuel refining, and for ammonia. So we, it's the technology is known. However, the new site and then being able to connect it to the electric grid is, is the brand new piece of this of this project and one that's still under construction. Thank you for, for sharing, Mark. Appreciate the additional background um, and the wealth of information I'm sharing from your perspective in the presentation. We're going to move along to uh, hear from a, a colleague of yours, uh, Brian Pivovar, um, and uh, we appreciate your, your time, Mark. So, Brian, if you're around to turn on your video and say hi, I'll, I'll just briefly note uh, an introduction here. Um, uh, Brian is a senior research fellow and fuel cell group manager in the Chemistry and Nanosciences Center at NREL. Uh, Brian oversees NREL's electrolysis and fuel cell research and development activities and supports strategic planning in the areas of electrons to molecules and the hydrogen at scale, uh, along with polymers and membranes. Um, Brian has uh, over 25 years of experience in the area of polymer electrolytes and fuel cells, and he's a pioneer in several areas of fuel cell and electrolyzer development, including membranes, electrocatalysts, and membrane electrode assemblies and interfaces. We're thrilled to have you with us, Brian, to share a little bit more on some of the um, electrolyzer and fuel cell parts of the hydrogen technology world. And I will uh, turn it over to you for your presentation, and then um, we'll, we'll have a, some time for questions at the tail end. Wonderful. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk to everybody. Um, Mark did a great job of kind of talking about where hydrogen sits. I'm going to sp talk specifically about electrolyzers and fuel cells. Um, they're two of the key aspects of making a hydrogen economy work, um, and they're not always properly uh, understood. So uh, I'm going to blow through these, but really at NREL, um, I've been pushing the idea that the 2010s were the decade of wind and solar and the 2020s are going to be the decade of hydrogen. There's all sorts of activities that I think that most of you see, um, but really for me, this is the decade for hydrogen. As, as, as um, part of that, um, the Secretary of Energy announced the Hydrogen Energy Earth Shot, which is called the Hydrogen Shot. It's all about getting down to $1 per kilogram of hydrogen in a decade. And a lot of what I'll talk about is going to be focused on getting to that cost price for hydrogen. $2 starts to trigger a lot um, in the energy domain space, but getting down to $1 a kilogram really makes the economics of hydrogen look good. As part of this energy earth shot, um, there's this nine and a half billion dollars for clean hydrogen technologies that was in the bipartisan infrastructure law, eight billion for at least four regional hubs, one billion for electrolysis research development and demonstration. That's where most of our work comes into place um, in H2 New, which I'll talk a little bit about, which is uh, a consortium that I'm director for, um, focused on the next generation of electrolyzers. Uh, there's also a lot of R&D and, and lab involvement for this half billion that's for clean hydrogen technology manufacturing and recycling R&D. But you can see there's basically um, over half a trillion dollars of hydrogen projects in the pipeline, and there's government support um, in the U.S. for $9.5 billion in these different areas. That really gets us around to what are fuel cells, what are electrolyzers, and I'll go through... Um, a little bit of fuel cell electrolyzer 101. The simple thing to say is, is that they're both electrochemical devices. Uh, a fuel cell, you can say, operates in, let's say, the forward direction, although forward and reverse are arbitrary here, where you're taking chemical energy, things like hydrogen and oxygen, and you're basically making water. That's the same as combustion, and people have looked at putting hydrogen into vehicles in internal combustion capacity. Um, and it's the same overall reaction that liberates the energy to allow you to do things. However, because you avoid combustion in a fuel cell, you can do it much cleaner. And because of the specifics of hydrogen, you can actually do the electrochemistry of this at much lower temperatures. So by avoiding high temperatures, and avoiding combustion, you avoid some of the air pollution problems and other concerns with higher temperature operation that are uniquely enabled by hydrogen as a fuel in fuel cells. Electrolyzers basically do the exact opposite or the reverse, and they take water and they give you hydrogen and oxygen, and the hydrogen can then be stored and used for other things. In some cases, we actually use the oxygen. There's things like manned spaceflight, 
um, and nuclear submarines, where the air that people breathe is actually coming from um, oxygen that's made from water electrolysis. Um, and a lot of the electrolysis companies actually started out that way. But this, avail this, uh, this ability to go forward and backwards with hydrogen circularly and electrochemically is really a key aspect of why the draw for fuel cells and electrolyzers are being pursued. Different, there's a bunch of different types of fuel cells and electrolyzers, and they're usually type characterized by the electrolyte. The electrolyte is, is what's shown in the middle here, and it has to let ions go through, typically protons or the hydrogen ions. However, hydroxide ions or even carbonate ions can also complete the circuit or oxide ions. And so polymer electrolytes and alkaline are, tend to be the low temperature technologies. Phosphoric acid and molten carbonate tend to be medium um, temperature applications and solid oxide um, tends to be the high temperature um, electrolyte in these systems. The polymer electrolyte and the solid oxide are solids and they offer an advantage in this and it's where most of the research is going on right now. And polymer electrolytes are what I'll primarily talk about but any one of these technologies is possible to either work as a fuel cell or as an electrolyzer. Next slide. So that's kind of what a single cell looks like. And, and typically you have this single cell electrolyte. It's connected to electrodes. You have things like gas diffusion layers or some other kind of flow field design. And you take these single cells and you can start building them up into stacks. The stack on the right side just gives you an example of what these stacks look like. The same way you would stack batteries and put a number of batteries together to grow the voltage or grow the current. And then when you're done with these systems, they can run cars. And here's a picture of a Clarity and a Mirai. Um, that's the example of the fuel cell side. The, the top right stack is also what an electrolysis stack would look like. So you have these different systems that can basically be made by stacking these things together to get to the power level, which is a combination of both the voltage and the current that's desired for an application. A lot of this has come from basically the advancements and the money that's been invested in making light duty vehicles work. So this is a, a slide taken from Nissan where they have a fuel cell stack. It's slightly bigger than a briefcase or right around a briefcase size and it replaces the internal combustion engine. It is the power plant that makes the vehicles go. Um, it has different support equipment and I didn't put a bunch of these balance of plant features inside of it. But at the heart of it, there's this technology, which is the membrane electrode assembly. And you can see a cross section of it. They have gas diffusion layers. They have anodes, which basically are the catalyst layers that handle the hydrogen side. There is a membrane or another electrolyte in a different type of fuel cell or electrolyzer. There's a cathode and there's a zoom on, on the cathode here because the cathode is really the biggest limiting factor in these um, or, or the highest research need in these systems. And on the right side, you can kind of see the, the porosity of these things, the fact that they have really dilute precious metals on conductive carbon that are in lots of places. It's these types of components that end up getting a lot of the research that enable these types of devices to work. I think of these MEAs as the piston of the fuel cell or electrolyzer. It's the heart that makes the device work. I, I bring up this slide because it basically talks about the costs in PEM fuel cell um, systems. If you go back to 20, the early 2000s, you're talking about systems that were almost $300 a kilowatt, even when projected to large scale manufacturing. There was a hydrogen fuel initiative that ran in the mid 2000 aughts, and there was billions of dollars placed into investment by automobile industries um, and governments uh, from across the world that really allowed us to take the system cost down from something that would have been prohibitive at like 250 or $300 a kilowatt down to areas that are now below $50 a kilowatt um, at scale. And while they did this, precious metals also were decreased, but it really took this billions of dollars to get there. And that was really to make um, light duty vehicles much more cost parity in terms of fuel cell performance and cost. 
but there's an infrastructure issue with hydrogen that still is a challenge, as well as the fact that battery electric vehicles have advanced and, and are great options, particularly in the light duty vehicle segment. Um, the other problem for fuel cells beyond just um, the hydrogen infrastructure is, is getting to scale in the supply chain to make these at the million unit types of level is, is also um, a hurdle that needs to be overcome. So on the use side, um, you know, we break down hydrogen to make, move, store, and, and use typically. Um, the key aspects for hydrogen are how they take on transportation and industry and that these are the strongest economic drivers for hydrogen, but also the most difficult to decarbonize. Some of this is also difficult or impossible to fully electrify. And a lot of the research now in fuel cells is focused on um, heavy duty applications and stationary where the lifetimes um, need to be much higher. So right now the current systems tend to do well for light duty vehicle transportation, which is five to 8,000 hours. And now we're looking at going to things that may be as much as 30 or 80,000 hours, um, depending on if you're talking about heavy duty or stationary applications. And so there's a lot of research still going on in those areas to try to hit the heavier duty markets. Uh, and that's really kind of the next step for fuel cell research. But I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the, the fuel cell side. I wanted to spend more of the time kind of really talking on the electrolysis side. And electrolysis is really a key for connecting the electricity markets to the transportation and the industrial markets. And hydrogen has this ability to be a parallel in terms of an energy distribution system to the electric grid and the gas infrastructure. The key is, is that electrolysis is kind of the first step to make this happen. And it has the most competitive economics for integrating with renewables moving forward while still enabling these difficult to decarbonize sectors. From the electrolysis side, and this is somewhat true for the fuel cell side as well, I talked about the different electrolyzers quantifying or having an impact on what applications um, areas went in. Alkaline electrolyzers have been deployed at the 100 megawatt scale a few times in the history of mankind um, in Africa and in Norway, um, tied to hydroelectric power um, to make ammonia. They're really reasonably well-established lower capital cost systems, but they deal with this corrosive liquid electrolyte which means that they operate at lower pressure, lower operating current densities and have trouble with differential pressure, which is really why people have been really highly focused on polymer electrolyte membranes more recently, because they have a thin membrane that separates their electrodes so they can go to higher power densities and have lower ohmic losses. Also, it's a very similar technology to the fuel cell technology that was developed for vehicles which is made to turn on and off many times a day and last um, decades plus. There's a challenge for these materials in that they require titanium, iridium, and platinum and perfluorinated ionomers. And so some of the materials challenges are kind of balanced against um, the improvements and maybe operating conditions that one might want. And then on the high temperature end, these solid oxide systems offer much higher efficiency and um, don't have any exotic materials along the lines of the PEM systems. But operating at such high temperatures has real challenges, including turning off and turning on in, in dealing with the thermal cycling, which is something that they basically can't do well. Um, and then other things like steam conversion and separation challenges. When you operate below the boiling point of water, when the water is turned to oxygen, it naturally separates itself. And in the solid oxide systems, separating the steam from oxygen um, becomes a thermal integration challenge because you can condense the water, um, but then you spend a lot of energy revaporizing it. So these are some of the different aspects of why these are the electrolysis types that most people are looking at and, and how they're generally broken down in the different spaces. Uh, I'm just going to give kind of, I think, two slides that talk about some of the things that we're doing in H2 New. So H2 New stands for Hydrogen from the Next Generation Electrolyzers of Water. We started in October of 2020, and we were started as a $50 million project over five years that included nine national labs. We were split 75% for PEM electrolysis and 25% 
on solid oxide, oxide conducting electrolysis. Um, we tie together with a bunch of other things that are going on in the DOE in terms of different consortium. And we're really the stepping point for that $1 billion over the next five years of clean electrolysis work that will be done underneath the bipartisan infrastructure law. The focus is really on durability of these systems. And what's happened is, is that electrolyzers have really had re really a limited amount of R&D gone into them. Uh, historically, they were basically two or three orders of magnitude less interesting in terms of R&D funding than the fuel cell systems. And so because of that, we had limited fundamental knowledge of degradation mechanisms and couldn't put together effective accelerated aging tests. H2 News taking on those things and understanding kind of cost performance durability trade-offs to understand how you put these systems together and how you'd operate them integrated into larger energy systems in the best overall ways to drive hydrogen costs down as well as possible. A lot of this kind of talks about modeling work um, and understanding where the cost drivers are and how to get to them. This is analysis work um, that Mark Ruth, who gave the previous talk, has led talking about um, how we get to the cost targets that we're looking at. H2 News primarily focused on doing the R&D to help stack costs, but we also translate these kind of gains into hydrogen levelized costs, um, but I won't talk about them here. We talk about current stack costs of being on the order of about $350 um, per kilowatt, and we know that we need to get those down to $100 or below. Um, you can see here the color coding talks about the different areas. The catalyst coated membrane is a large cost driver and that's largely driven by the amount of precious metal and an assumption that you can't take credit for the recycling of those metals at the end of life, which would help lower those numbers. Um, but all of these components um, need to be reduced in cost. And historically, electrolysis systems haven't been driven by capital costs, but now that we're trying to make $2 per kilogram and $1 per kilogram hydrogen, instead of 10 or $20 per kilogram hydrogen, we need to take every penny out of these systems we can. H2 News focused on these three areas that are highlighted. Basically, increased efficiency, which has really increased current density. The, operate, the ability to operate at higher powers allows you to work with less cells and do the same amount of work. Decreasing the precious metal loading is also a big deal, especially in the midterm. Um, and then scale up is this challenge as well. And it's not just the process of going to larger manufacturing scales, it's also developing the manufacturing processes that allow you to do that cost effectively. And so you can see kind of here from the current to the midterm targets, we have these big gains, which are the green bars where we're taking out a lot of the costs. And then going from the midterm to the ultimate target, we, we further attack those costs by increasing the power density, decreasing the amount of precious metal needs, and then taking advantage of some of these scale up challenges. And I think that that's what I was going to give as an overview. Um, and with that, I would just thank you for your time and be happy to answer any questions you had um, either here or offline in these spaces. Thank you very much, Brian. It's an awesome presentation. And I know we have a couple of questions from the Q and A that'll sync up here. Um, and we have a, a couple of minutes to address those. So let's turn to one. So, um, Appreciating the, the slide on the screen right now is around stack costs. I think there's a question about a different kind of potential stack um, in regards to, um, are you aware, or could you share about any research that's being conducted on dual use cells? Um, so cells that might have electrolysis and then switch modes to fuel cell. So you could have sort of effectively one stack um, for, for dual use. So, so those are typically referred to as reversible fuel cells or, you know, um, because fuel cells were here kind of first, I think, because they're reversible electrolyzers, reversible fuel cells, but usually they're reversible systems. Um, and so there are things that people are looking at. And what it generally comes down to is, is there's real challenges with making one system do both. Um, for the PEM systems specifically, um, you use platinum on both electrodes in a fuel cell, but you use iridium specifically on one of the electrodes. 
And if you're doing this at low temperature, you have this issue that the fuel cell gets fed gas and the electrolyzer gets fed water and gives off gas. And so there's a lot of challenges in making that work. The solid oxide systems, which work on high temperature, don't have some of the liquid um, gas challenges, um, but they also have um, other challenges with the temperature. So typically people have looked at this and there's some applications where having a specific single reversible system may be better for you. But in most situations, the economics actually look promising to do both the separate systems, particularly at low temperature. High temperature may have better options available for reversible systems, but currently the R&D barriers are enough that you wouldn't design a system to have one integrated system at this point in time. You'd go with two separate systems, um, but that could change with the right R&D advances in the future. Thank you for exploring that topic, Brian. Um, I think uh, another question that we um, have heard about sort of across our time together today, but also in the registration process was around the application of green hydro hydrogen to microgrids or within the grids for power generation. Um, they're wondering, um, you know, New York State has made declarations that they intend to advance an understanding and development of green hydrogen microgrids. Um, and that's one application of hydrogen fuel cell technologies in a grid or energy production capacity. Can you explain, like, what's, what's your take on the potential role for hydrogen fuel cells uh, on the grid? And what do you think we know? Or and are there any big meaty questions you want to put out there, things that we don't know yet about those applications? Sure. So, you know, Mark kind of touched on this a little bit because there's the build out to get to more electricity coming into the grid, there's these other cur otherwise curtailable electricity resources. And a lot of it comes down to, you can make green hydrogen. And then what's the best use of the green hydrogen? Uh, a lot of times in the round trip, electrons to electrons, the green hydrogen to basically make electrons back for the grid isn't the highest value proposition for the hydrogen at large scale. Now, the same way that cheap electrons from renewable electricity spill over into hydrogen, that spill into cheap hydrogen, cheap hydrogen can spill over from the transportation markets, the steel or the ammonia markets into the electricity or the heating markets as well. But they're not the highest value proposition and a lot of it will come back to different policy drivers for this. Um, the thing is, is if you put your extra electricity into a battery, your only choice is to use it as an electron again at some point. But once you make the hydrogen molecule, it can be turned back into electricity, but a lot of times it's not the highest value proposition for it. So while it can do that, um, and while there is a big need for fuel cells in the energy system, and part of that would tie to microgrids as well, um, when you have hydrogen around, it could become the economic situation to make that work. A lot of times it's not the best from an overall energy systems perspective to think about those applications. Mark has a publication on the technical and economic potential of hydrogen in different um, systems, and it gives a good valuization for the markets where hydrogen would be paid for at different levels. And what you find is, is that the transportation and ammonia markets will pay the highest premium for these and kind of the electricity and the heating markets tend to pay the lowest. I don't know, Mark, if you wanted to add anything else to that. No, I, I think that's a great summary. Thanks for that, Brian. I think the one thing I would add is that the purpose of microgrids and in many ways, my thinking on purpose of, or the potential for hydrogen in the electric grid as a whole has moved to something more around re resilience, which is thinking about what happens if there is a storm or another effect, having a molecular energy source provides a lot of opportunities to be able to produce, as, as you talked about with fuel cells, be able to produce high electricity where you need it, as opposed to bringing it in on transmission lines that may be lost as we see fires in California or things like super storms in the Northeast, thinking about some of those where the molecular systems are more hardened uh, as a whole, and because you can decouple the amount of power going to, in other words, the amount of kilowatts that you're getting out of 
a, a energy storage system at any time from the total amount of energy stored, the kilowatt hours that it's stored within it, with hydrogen, you end up with a much longer storage opportunity. So very long duration microgrid storage and backup is, is a really nice opportunity. So in my mind, I'm starting to think about it, talk about the resilience problem a lot more. And it, it sounds like this theme that um, you both are exploring, Mark and Brian, does uh, perhaps sort of dovetail with some of the questions about um, location or regionality in regards to proximity to markets, as you had touched on, Brian, or uh, Mark, as you were talking about in terms of uh, resiliency or um, sort of the grid applications. Um, I think there's time for maybe one more question before we move to our next presentation. Um, so wondering, uh, this is probably one for you, Brian, um, regarding fuel cells. Are there differences in emissions outputs? Um, and the, the individual asking the question also shared uh, their understanding that some installed SF, F, SOFC systems have non-zero NOx emissions. Um, so wondering if you have any comments uh, along those lines. So, so most of the deployed SOFC systems to date are being fed off of methane. And so those have um, emissions, whether they're internally reformed, which is typically the case, they'll have CO2 emissions. NOx really isn't a problem, but there's CO2 emissions because they're being methane fed. It, they could also run those systems off of hydrogen if hydrogen was available. It's just that methane's available now. And it's one of the advantages for the SOFCs is, is that they run so hot that they can run directly off of methane, which is what most SOFCs do today. Thank you very much. And thank you, Brian and uh, Mark, for, for your time and sharing your knowledge and perspectives with us. Um, and we'll, uh, I know there were a couple other questions that popped up that we'll make sure we capture and uh, hopefully have some time to explore in, in other um, venues. I do want to move us along uh, to our, our next session here, um, uh, which is going to be focused on um, hydrogen storage and delivery. Um, so methods, materials, and safety. Um, and for this, we have uh, two uh, sort of shorter presentations here, and then we're going to move um, into a Q and A for both. Um, so I'll ask folks, please continue sharing the questions that you've got in that Q and A as soon as you've got them, even if they're not about the session that what we're talking about. If there's something you want to get into the mix, uh, it's helpful to hear that and be able to figure out where we can fold it in. Or um, and also after this next session on methods, materials, and safety, we will have an open ideation. Uh, session while we're we'll looking for your contributions in the Q&A pods so that we can sort of synthesize what we think we're hearing and maybe test a little bit to hear what's uh, most important um, to continue uh, in each of these areas of discussion. So with that in mind, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Chris San Marchi and Nick Barillo uh, into our uh, conversation here for the next two presentations. I'm going to do introductions for both and then we'll turn it over to Chris to share and uh, then uh, Nick to share, and then we'll have that Q&A piece. Um, so um, Dr. Chris San Marchi is a principal investigator, distinguished member of technical staff with Sandia's uh, Hydrogen and Metallurgy Science Department, where his materials research focuses on the interaction of hydrogen and metals. Um, Nick has published uh, extensively in the area of hydrogen assisting assisted fracture, including authoring the technical reference for hydrogen compatibility of materials. Uh, Dr. San Marchi also works with various organizations to develop codes and standards for hydrogen infrastructure. Um, so we're eager to hear uh, your wealth of knowledge here, Dr. San Marchi, in the, in the course of the presentation and the Q and A. Um, after uh, that presentation, we'll also have um, Nick Brillo join. So uh, Mr. Brillo has a joint appointment as executive director of the Center Center for Hydrogen Safety and as the Hydrogen Safety Program Manager at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Um, and with the Center for Hydrogen Safety, Nick leads the development of comprehensive safety guidance, outreach and education materials, and facilitates access to hydrogen safety experts, uh, along with providing a forum to partner on worldwide technical solutions. Um, Nick, in his role as the Hydrogen Safety Program Manager for PNNL, the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, Nick directs uh, multidisciplinary teams of industry experts, scientists, and engineers focused on uh, safety across a range of hydrogen and fuel cell technology projects. So, um, eager to hear from both of you in, the, in these presentations, and please do keep the, the questions coming as we go, and then we'll, we'll carve out some time at the tail end for Q&A. So, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. San Marchi first. So I'm, I'm Chris San Marquis. I'm at Sandia National Labs here in Livermore, California, where we have a 
rather unique laboratory call that we refer to as the hydrogen effects on materials laboratory. And um, as was described, my particular core uh, focus is on the interaction of materials with hydrogen um, in the support of, of safety and the development of codes and standards. So if we go to the next slide, I won't dwell on this. You've probably seen this already today, the standard um, H2 at scale uh, diagram from, from DOE, but I did want to mention this uh, quote, which I find quite quite intriguing. Hydrogen is the Swiss Army knife of decarbonization. And this really refers to the flexibility that hydrogen has and can have in a decarbonized uh, energy system. Uh, there, there are a lot of potential uses of hydrogen from a transportation fuel to energy storage to um, enabling electrification and, and even in industry where it's already used quite a lot. So if we go to the next slide. <clears throat> so this is a, a brief outline of, of the, the four key things I wanna touch on. Um, how is hydrogen delivered and stored? What is hydrogen embrittlement and, and when is it important? Um, I did manage to hear uh, a few minutes earlier this morning and um, I, I don't think hydrogen embrittlement is all that well understood. And so hopefully um, I'll be able to, to give you some, some new information there. And then I wanna talk about materials and, and, and what does hydrogen actually do to, the, to materials and, and what do we know? And then I wanna distinguish the materials conversation from the structural integrity conversation. I think these are sometimes confused um, and, and so I'll differentiate the materials from the structures question. So, you know, hydrogen technologies are, are well known. Um, we use hydrogen quite, quite a lot in um, industry and in other places. And hydrogen is, is on the road now. It's delivered around, it's moved around. Um, there are different ways uh, that it is moved around. Um, in the US, we have something like uh, 2,500 kilometers of dedicated hydrogen pipelines. And this is, is a principal way that large quantities of gaseous hydrogen are transported. Um, most of these pipelines currently are in the Gulf Coast area and support uh, the refining of gasoline and chemicals industry. But it's also distributed by truck. And so there are um, tube trailers on the road, um, particularly if you're in um, areas where hydrogen is used uh, quite a lot. For example, in California, where we have fleets of, of vehicles, um, you, you'll see hydrogen tube trailers tra trailers on the road. In the future, we imagine hydrogen being transported in, in larger quantities to support the decarbonization efforts. And so we might see uh, hydrogen transported by by rail and, and by maritime. Um, <clears throat> with regard to, to storage of gaseous hydrogen, that's the, uh, a common way to store vast quantities of hydrogen is in, in, at, in local areas, like at hydrogen fueling stations, usually we have vessels, pressure vessels that store hydrogen up to a, a thousand bar. But um, in geologic, uh, um, Geologic formations are a key way to, to store very large quantities of, of hydrogen. And in the US, we have several sites where hydrogen is stored in salt domes. For example, when you need very large uh, quantities of hydrogen to support some, some process um, or some activity. <clears throat> and there are a number of activities currently looking at other geologic storage um, technologies and and understand what are what are the what's what do we need to be concerned about in these other geologic types of formations, um, and and we anticipate that in the future there will be other types of geologic formations. But currently, the the only commercial geologic storage method is is salt caverns. And then liquid hydrogen is also transported and stored. Um, it, that is pretty common. A lot of warehouses, for example, have transitioned from battery powered forklifts to um, fuel cell powered forklifts. And in many cases that hydrogen is delivered as a liquid and stored on site as a liquid. 
simply to increase the energy density. Usually that liquid is transported by, um, by truck, but um, there are some activities looking at, at rail and maritime transportation of liquid hydrogen as well. And then on the right here, I, I mentioned carriers. So carriers are something that gets a lot of attention where you can store hydrogen in a, in a solid or in some other chemical as a liquid or, or even as a gas. Um, there are a lot of challenges with, with carriers. Um, and as far as I know, there, there aren't any commercial usage of carriers at, at a large scale. So if we go to the next slide, just quickly summarize some of the um, uh, features of the different methods. And, and I, I put a question here, what is the best method to transport and store hydrogen? And, and there's no simple answer to that question. I would argue that that is a poorly posed question, a question I hear quite frequently actually. Um, and the only response to that is it depends. Um, it really depends on the on the use case and, and the quantities that you need and, and how you're gonna be using it. But gaseous hydrogen is, is typically stored at very high pressure to, to achieve the energy density um, and efficiency in terms of storage. Uh, it's the current state of the art for for vehicles, um, both passenger vehicles, buses, and, and other types of mobility efforts. As I mentioned, it, it's stored in geolo um, a, as a gas. Hydrogen is stored as a gas in in, in salt domes. Um, <clears throat> it's it's the gas is transported over long distances in in pipelines, for example. Um, liquid is is often used, particularly when you need a large quantity and you want um, to convert to to minimize the amount of volume that you need to store the challenges with liquid is hydrogen is liquid at a very low temperature 20 kelvin this is lower than the temperature of liquid nitrogen um, but but it is a well-known technology and used quite quite um, readily and then carriers as i mentioned um, i'm not aware that they're being commercially used at a large scale and another challenge with carriers is these are often toxic or um, chemicals that are very reactive. So if we go to the next slide, um, we'll transition. Um, I know I only have a few more minutes here. Um, so, so what are some of the, the, the challenges with hydrogen? So hydrogen technologies are not new. Uh, in the US, we use about 10 billion kilograms per year. As I mentioned, we have quite a lot of dedicated hydrogen pipelines in the US. Um, so, so this is all known technology. We all know how, how, how to manage and use hydrogen in these different scenarios. It's used extensively uh, um, in, as I said, in, in making gasoline, it's used in, um, in metals refining uh, significantly. It's, it's used um, to make fertilizer. So, so we know how to manage it. There are some growing technologies, for example, hydrogen powered forklifts to replace battery units, and it's being used in buses and in other technologies uh, quite extensively. Um, what, are, what are some of the, the real challenges? I mean, one challenge is it's too expensive, and, and you heard from, uh, from Mark and um, Brian earlier about some of the efforts to bring down costs of, of hydrogen production. Um, <clears throat> if we want to replace infrastructure, existing infrastructure, um, that, that's quite a significant cost. Um, I, I put some very round uh, back of the envelope numbers here of the cost that it would be to replace, for example, natural gas infrastructure or gasoline infrastructure. Um, that's not really uh, viable. We need to, to try to be able to use existing infrastructure if we're really going to make large headway with using hydrogen. And the more most important thing is is safety. Again, we know how to use hydrogen safely, and I think sometimes the safety aspects are are overemphasized. But we need to change how we look at hydrogen. Um, we need, as I call it, a non hard hat relationship with hydrogen. If we continue to treat it as a as a chemical rather than a fuel, I think we will have we will remain having significant challenges with. Uh, rolling out hydrogen technologies at a large scale. So if we go to the next slide, um, we'll transition to what is hydrogen embrittlement and when is it important? Next slide. <clears throat> um, when we think about hydrogen embrittlement, we need to think about three factors. We need to think about the environment. So this is essentially the hydrogen environment. 
We need to understand the materials and the characteristics of the materials. And the, and the overlooked component is the stress. So in order to have hydrogen embrittlement, you need to have a stress on your system. And the embrittlement problem can be managed to a large degree by managing the stress in the system. So really hydrogen embrittlement is, is occurring at the intersection of these three components. Um, and we need to understand all three components uh, uh, rigorously. So if we go to the next slide. So just to give, give uh, an example, a, a very simple example. So this is some fatigue crack growth rate data and the color symbols represent tests in, measured in hydrogen gas and, and the black dashed line and, and X's there represent measurements in air. And what you can see is the fatigue is accelerated. This is a log scale. So the fatigue is accelerated in hydrogen by a factor of 10. So this is quite um, significant. So the question becomes, well, can we use this material in hydrogen? If you go to the next slide, the reality is that this material is used. It's the material that's used in, in transportable gas cylinders for transporting hydrogen uh, every day. And if you have hydrogen in a, in a laboratory setting, you probably have hydrogen in one of these um, gas cylinders from this exact same material. And this material is also used in hydrogen powered forklifts of which there are tens of thousands currently in operation in the US. So it, the hydrogen embrittlement problem can be managed. We need to understand what those properties are, but we can manage it. So if we go to the next slide, I'll try to wrap up here quickly. Um, so I wanna share another example, pipelines. So if we go to the next uh, slide, and it turns out that pipeline steels behave almost identically to those chrome moly steels that I mentioned on the previous slides that are used in transportable gas cylinders. The materials are different, but the response is essentially the same. This is again a plot of fatigue data comparing the colored symbols representing fatigue in, in hydrogen environments with the, the dotted line uh, below that, which is in air. And what's quite interesting is that all this data represents several different grades of um, pipeline steel and they all behave about the same. So this is, is quite important because it tells us that we can um, manage this problem in a general way because all of the materials essentially behave the same. And so this enables us then to, to create some general guidance and rules of how you would manage hydrogen in a, in a pipeline setting. So if we go to the next slide. Um, I see some of the symbols got a little bit corrupted here, but this is again, some more fatigue data. And there's this, this, sort of misunderstanding about the effects of hydrogen and the effects of partial pressure. And if we use small quantities of hydrogen, you know, the embrittlement problem goes away. And what this data is attempting to show is that is not the case. So the red information is 100% hydrogen. The green is 3% hydrogen, otherwise the same overall pressure. And we do see a difference at a low value of what we call delta K. So this delta K parameter, you can think of it as, as the stress in the system. Um, as the delta K get, goes to higher values, uh, you can see that these curves converge and essentially you have the same response, whether it's 100% hydrogen or 3% hydrogen. And so we should not just assume that if the hydrogen partial pressure in a blend scenario, for example, is low, that we can ignore it. That's simply not the case. So if we go to the next slide, well, I'll, um, oh, so this is a, a, another set of data that sort of emphasizes that. So this is some data from the literature looking at the fracture resistance as opposed to the um, fatigue in the previous plot. And uh, what you can see here is this is a relative bar chart of the fracture resistance. So the, the large bar there is, you know, if you have no hydrogen present, if you have about a bar of hydrogen, in this case, 1% hydrogen, although we need to think about the partial pressure, that is the governing parameter, not the percentage. But nevertheless, you can see 1% hydrogen, you see a very large reduction in fracture resistance. The fracture resistance de continues to decrease as you add more amounts of hydrogen, but, um, but that additional decrease with higher quantities of hydrogen becomes less and less. So if we go to the next slide, uh, I'll quickly touch on uh, the structures. So, so that is the material response, but in terms of the structures, we need to understand 
what are the stresses in the system to understand how the system is going to respond. As I showed previously, transportable gas cylinders, the material is very strongly affected by hydrogen, but the gas cylinders themselves are quite safe because of the way they're designed and utilized. So if we go to the next slide, <clears throat> uh, if we consider uh, a, a, a real X52 type of pipe, and consider some different scenarios in terms of how that pipe is operated. So um, this R parameter that you see on this plot is the ratio of the minimum pressure to the maximum pressure. And you can see that green curve represents a delta in pressure that is smaller than in the red curve. Um, and, and so that, that ratio is 0.7 in that case versus 0.5. And, and those solid lines represent 100% hydrogen versus the dashed line, which represents 20% hydrogen at the same total pressure of 200 bar in this particular example. And if we do some calculations to predict the evolution of defects, so all structures have defects, and the way we manage pressure systems is to understand how those defects evolve with time. So if we go to the next slide, uh, what I did is I did some simple predictions of the growth of these defects in uh, uh, hydrogen environments for a pipeline system, assuming a typical type of flaw that you would find in these systems. And what you can see, those red lines represent the R of 0.5 and 100% and 20% hydrogen essentially are no different. But if we change the stress ratio in the system, we can see that the crack will grow much, much more slowly because our change in stress, which is what drives fatigue, is less. So I should have mentioned what this plot is. It's, it's a plot of the evolution of a crack in a pipeline with number of pressure cycles. And so this, this data is essentially meant to emphasize how um, uh, how we can manage operations of a system to um, achieve the safety conditions that we would like to achieve in a, in, a, in a particular system. So if we go to the next slide, I realize this was a whirlwind and I've gone way over. Um, so this is a summary. I, I won't uh, read all of this content to you. Uh, the slides are available. You have those slides and you can refer to this. If you go to the next slide, it's just uh, um, has a, a few, um, informational resources that are available, a couple URLs on the next slide um, th that are resources for, for hydrogen embrittlement. And there's contact information for um, some of my colleagues, both at Sandia and at Pacific Northwest. So with that, um, I'll, I'll stop talking and, and kick it over to, to Nick. Thank you, Chris, and just want to thank folks at, sorry, this is Jason, the facilitator. There were a couple of questions that came in, so please keep those coming as Nick shares. Maybe additional questions will come, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. Nick, go ahead and take it away. Can you hear me now? We sure can. Go for All it. Right. All right. Sorry, everyone. So um, I'm going to jump in real quick. This will be a, a sort of a quick tour, so hold on to your seatbelts, and uh, hope you have your tennis shoes on to run with me. Uh, let's go to the next slide. I'm going to talk about safety considerations real quickly. Uh, lots of applications. You probably have heard about this already, so I won't belabor this. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so just for those that, that maybe we haven't heard about the properties, um, in gas form, hydrogen is extremely uh, lighter than air, 14 times lighter than air, rises and disperses rapidly after those pressure effects are lost. Um, flammable range fairly wide. Um, in liquid form, it's it's you can see it's very cold to get it to a liquid. It's a cryogen. You can't compress it to a liquid. And when that liquid expands, it's about 850 times uh, in moving from the liquid phase to the gas phase. A kilogram of hydrogen is roughly equivalent to a gallon of gasoline in, in the energy content there. Next slide. Um, some additional properties and some of the potential hazards. So it is flammable. It's non-irritating, non-toxic. It isn't an asphyxiant like all gases can be. Um, it's non-corrosive. Um, certainly, uh, we did mention uh, in the previous presentation about embrittlement. Um, colorless, odorless, and tasteless. So um, some of the hazards that you could see, combustion, both fire and explosion. Pressure hazards under most of our uh, storage scenarios. The cryogens got have low temperature and hazards associated with that. And then I mentioned the embrittlement asphyxiation. Next slide. 
So comparing some of the fuels that you may be a little more comfortable with, um, you have uh, natural gas and gasoline here compared to hydrogen. I'm not gonna go over all of these, but let me point out a few. So uh, hydrogen being odorless, natural gas has a mercaptan, and you'll pick up those benzenes and gasoline. It's one of the big differences. The gasoline and natural gas are either fairly close to air or heavier than air. So where the hydrogen is gonna move up and away, those others will stay uh, where they're at or, or uh, proceed to, to stay at low levels. Um, flyable range, while the four to 75 is quite, quite large, the low number is the one that's really important in most scenarios. So you can see gasoline has a lower flyable limit that is even lower than hydrogen. Um, minimum ignition energy, that's at, at a, um, a stoichiometric concentration, ideal concentration, but but really as a comparison, you see that it's, it's about an order of magnitude plus uh, uh, ignition source is about an order of magnitude plus less in, in energetic that is needed for the ignition. And then you can see the by, by weight that, that um, it's about two times that of gasoline, but by volume, it's four times less. Next slide. So um, big picture on safety here. Uh, we all know safety issues could be a deal breaker, um, especially with new technology. We've got a great foundation, Chris mentioned it, um, about a century being used in the industrial applications. However, it's used as a fuel is new to many. They may lack the experience or expertise. Some may have misconceptions and may not know what they don't know. We've seen all these dangerous assumptions, whether it be apathy or whether it be um, this misconception, it's just like any other flammable gas. And certainly we've all heard that it's far too dangerous to use. Failure to address the knowledge gaps can result in incidents and industry setbacks. That's why it's so important. Next slide. Um, here are here are five incidents that have occurred um, in relatively recent time frame. Um, I won't go through all these incidents, but but what I want to point out in all this is is that the the common uh, the common factor through all these is human error. And so while you know while hydrogen itself tends to be a little less forgiving than some of the other fuels, it's certainly those human errors are the ones that are going to cause us issues. Next slide. In comparison, you see here gasoline where we have, you know, we, we've grown accustomed to gasoline, apathetic really, and, you, and natural gas being the same way, you see we have lots of fires, lots of deaths and injuries and property loss. And so I want to frame it all up as um, it's just another fuel, and and like all fuels, it contains hazards, and and we have to be um, we have to be aware of those hazards and apply ourselves correctly. I remember filling my tractor up with gasoline. It had a three inch opening, and all these vapors are pouring out. And thinking, wow, this is a really hazardous operation, and I don't really think about it all that much. Next slide. So um, I want to point out that there, from an applied safety side, there are really three elements that are really critical. Codes and standards, um, best safety practices, and then this concept of safety culture. Next slide. Uh, codes and standards, we're all familiar with those. Those are really meant to provide a uniformity of safety requirements, help us safely build, maintain, and operate those systems, provide safety officials and inspectors what they need to give approval, and ultimately it bolsters confidence and, and acceptance. Next slide. Um, this is just a quick slide. Keep moving on the next slide. This, you can go back and look at this. This is some of the international codes and standards that are available. Um, and this is in the United States, NFPA 2 and the International Fire Code tend to be the primaries and they reference out to these other design standards. Again, feel free to look at this afterwards. Next slide. Best safety practices, and I, I wanna really emphasize here that codes and standards alone are not enough to get the safety. They tend to protect um, the, the building occupants and the um, first responders and your neighbors, but they don't tend to protect the business real well itself. Best practices are necessary to ensure that, that the gap between some of those areas is covered, as well as, as we're implementing new technology to make sure that we've thoughtfully um, applied principles and practices to make sure that we don't have any incidents. Next slide. Um, being invested in safety, this is really about safety culture and um, really it's affected by your organization's beliefs, perceptions, and values. It's really going to be critical if we're going to build a sustainable legacy 
If we have learned long-term acceptance of this industry and helping you reach your impact and goals, you can see a Bradley curve here, DuPont, well known for their safety. And it was moving from the following rules because you have to, but to you want to, and moving to um, a commitment-based instead of a compliant, compliance-based approach. Next slide. General safety planning, uh, so resources available and on the right you see here, but want to emphasize whatever projects you're considering, safety planning really an important part of that. This document we made, been made has been made available to help you in that process. Um, it's, it's essential to protect the people from injury or death and to minimize damage to facilities. And we strongly encourage that, that you apply this approach early in the project to cover all facets of the project as well as all uh, participants. Next slide. So I'm gonna just real quickly hit a few of the safety basics. Um, it's a flammable gas, like all flammable gases, you need to uh, eliminate the hazards or define mitigation measures. System integrity, really important. Proper ventilation to prevent accumulations. Um, if we do need a discharge, managing those discharges to the right location at the right times, detecting and isolating leaks, and training personnel. These are all critical parameters of, of a big a big picture approach to safety with hydrogen. Next slide. Um, this slide, this next slide is really intending to throw a lot of terms at you. Um, there, there's a lot to consider. And so I don't, wouldn't have time in this short presentation to go over all of this, but it's just really important that, that you realize there are a lot of things that come into play and doing um, a good strong evaluation along the entire process, as well as management of change, all really, really important to make sure we do this safely. Next slide. So some resources for you to help you as we're, we're uh, getting close to finishing this up. Hydrogen Tools Portal, it's an online information portal. See the URL there. Um, that is, is, it's got a wide variety of, of safety and, and, and other information that can help you out, all integrated into one location. Best practices, lessons learned, um, codes and standards, a bibliography, lots of different materials that can really help you out. And then I'm with the Center for Hydrogen Safety. Let me tell you a little bit about that. Next slide. First, uh, here's some, just a quick overview of some of those resources in the Hydrogen Tools uh, portal. Um, uh, certainly some of the things I've mentioned as well as information on compatibility and materials. We're gonna move that out once Chris and his team get uh, another website up, we'll give a direct reference over to that. In the meantime, um, we still have some basic information there from Chris and his team. Next slide. The Center for Hygiene Safety, it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a global nonprofit membership organization. We're trying to champion those best uh, hygiene practices, uh, safety practices, best practices worldwide. Um, we're trying to empower the, the stakeholders in the work workforce, and then to ensure that safely and safe and timely transition to hygiene and fuel cell technologies. The image on the right, you can see really covers a lot of the different activities that we do. So this is really focused on applied hydrogen safety more than um, R&D, so keep that in mind. Next slide. Um, we really focus on collaborating, removing barriers and increasing knowledge. Um, uh, lots of collaboration goes on. It is a community setting. It's really meant to help all the community members and, and to take the burden off of any one member having to do all the work. Um, removing barriers, we have uh, resources and assets that can help you with, with identifying and managing those risks. And then ultimately, we want to help you to gain your own expertise. And that's what, what our webinars and, and conferences and workshops, et cetera, are all about. Um, so feel free to come onto our website to see some more of that. Next slide. I did want to point out real quickly that some of our membership, this is, we've, we've grown very, uh, very strong in the last three years. We went from uh, initially about 15 members in 2019. We're now at 83 members and 13 strategic partners worldwide. Next slide. And then I, I did want to focus a little bit on the courses. So, so e-learning and, and helping people get educated, really an important part of what we're doing. In these three columns on the right is our webinar series. Um, those are typically made available for free the day of. Uh, it's a charge after the fact. We have another one coming up on um, hazard analysis for hydrogen in, um, in June. The middle is, is our first responder safety e-learning courses. Those are all free. 
trying to help that community be prepared for what's what's happening and where they're going. And then on the left are some of our fundamental hydrogen safety courses. Um, in the red box, that those courses form up in support of a hydrogen safety credential, fundamental credential. So you could take all those nine courses, and then um, and then take that credential to help uh, validate your your knowledge and and your preparation for doing your work. Uh, again, the, the link up there that's good for getting to access these courses. Uh, next slide. So I want to really finish up saying, you know, we must recognize that the promise of hydrogen comes with the responsibility of safety. We're growing. The applications are growing in volume and diversity. Um, we, uh, the best methods of storing, handling, using hydrogen may not be well understood. So, so those safe practices are essential. And then things like the portal and uh, the Center for Hydrogen Safety that there to help you out. Uh, and I think I have one more final slide that gives my contact info. Uh, so feel free to reach out to me apart from this if you'd like to have some discussions or have questions. Okay, back to you, uh, Jason. Thank you very much, Nick, and thank you, Chris, for the awesome presentations. There are a handful of uh, questions that are coming in. I'm going to try to kind of sprint us through as many as we can here before we head towards our final session and adjournment for today. Um, so, uh, first up, this was one from earlier, but um, seems to fit in with our conversation here. Um, there was a question about when using hydrogen, um, and the example was during low solar or LBW production scenarios. Um, but the, the I think the core of it was around: are, are there any safety and storage concerns for hydrogen if it is activities on the screen here? Yep, we see them. All right. So those are miniature. And in the chat, we'd like to know kind of what else is missing. I, I do want to just. For, for what it's worth, um, we, we tried to orient this in a way to kind of informally and quickly synthesize things. This is not a um, complete exercise in that we've got everything in here or that the framework that you're seeing here is really particularly um, impactful. This is just something as a facilitation team we pulled together, just be able to quickly kind of parse things out. Um, and we thought there might be a couple of different themes related to our uh, research and analysis, policy or planning, pilots and activities, and then other stakeholder engagement. Um, and then sort of down the, the left uh, here, we've got uh, things related to production, um, transportation and distribution, um, uh, storage and uh, potential uses for hydrogen. So there's a little bit of a framework there um, to consider. Um, and my goal here is I'm just going to kind of recap a couple of things that are out here um, and just ask for folks to please continue to share in the chat. Um, whether it's something you see is missing here or something that you've got heartburn about or that you're eager to learn more about that we haven't touched on or touched on at the appropriate level of depth in this conversation, please put that in the chat. Um, it will not be the last opportunity to contribute um, by all means, quite the opposite. This is, I think, you know, the first in a series of much continued listening and learning around hydrogen's applications in New York State. And I do know we'll be doing a, a, an evaluation as well for today's event that we'll be distributing in the next week or so that will um, include you know, questions about if this was useful and how we structured it, along with the opportunity to identify other um, questions, areas of interest, specific needs that we have out there. Um, so sort of at a high level here in regards to research and analysis um, on uh, things that are related to production, um, there were questions about sort of the amount of renewables and related cost analysis, which ties a little bit into you know, curtailment, whether that's offshore wind or other renewables, but how do we take surplus renewables and fold it into the hydrogen space? Um, and that might have some mapping uh, against production uh, needs by use case. Um, that may not, of course, be tied to just renewables, but it'd be interesting to sort of, um, we heard at least one person identify that as something they're interested in exploring. Um, there's another one here for electrolyzers. How do they behave with um, time varying power input, which I think we raised as a question and heard a little bit from some of our presenters today. Um, so be curious to learn if there's more that we can dig up there um, and explore together. Uh, there's something here for uh, renewable natural gas as well in terms of green hydrogen um, from RNG. Um, and then lastly, there, we talked a little bit about local power generation um, connected to microgrids or grids or fleet concentrated power. So there's there's more there around that sort of nexus of production and uh, location, perhaps, to, to talk about also this theme of regionality that we've heard from uh, stakeholders throughout the course of your time together today. In regards to transportation, um, we definitely dug a little bit into blending rates there. 
um, and talked a little bit about leakage, um, but more in the transportation space. I would wonder when we think about things across the value chain, um, what does that mean? Um, uh, and of course, there's uh, cost and technical implications uh, related to um, distribution systems for buildings. And there were also a number of comments about buildings themselves and related costs or updates that would be needed along with the moving pieces to accommodate some of uh, those potential projects. Um, and then there's something here on transition um, fuel for cost effectiveness. So um, what are benefits from compounding sa savings in the natural gas systems? And what does that mean in a 2030 to 50 sort of time frame? Again, this is an incomplete capture, but hoping that we're just spurring some thoughts for you all to be adding into the chat here if things were missing. I did see one asking if this information would be available. There will be a, a recording and I believe uh, some other documentation produced from our, our time together today. So um, it may be this information in a different format or this format. This is like the equivalent of flip charts and post-it notes that we would have in person. Um, <laughs> and we have to try to make that in, uh, information a little bit more complete and synthesize it in a way that it's useful and usable, um, not just to you all in capturing what happened here, but also importantly to the NYSERDA team in helping to figure out where to continue to drive engagement and other um, informational activities. So related to storage, we talked a little bit about liquid and odorants in that last session. Um, we didn't touch up too much on seasonal storage um, to enhance renewables reliability, but that be, could be something we could explore more. Um, there was solid state we talked a little bit more about, um, and then uh, comparable safety storage technologies or um, materials uh, analysis uh, was noted as of interest. Um, we also did talk a little bit more about this question in regards to the extended durations. Um, I'm not going to continue to go through at this particular level of detail, but did do want to note that we are going to be sharing things. There were a number of questions around uses, whether that was efficiency for direct use, NOx emissions, supply demand analysis across different types, um, emission profiles, um, and then also sort of the comparable sort of what is a retrofit versus direct process look like. Um, under policy and planning, again, these are in, in, in perfect categorizations that are more relevant for just being able to synthesize. Um, but state investment in R&D for sure, CLCPA accounting for renewables, the hydrogen hubs related to electrolyzer supply chains um, came up quite a bit, um, private sector involvement. Um, we talked a little bit more about regulatory gaps or, or have an opportunity to explore more in regards to understanding uh, effects of existing regulations and planning for updating to meet market needs. Um, and then there were a range of items for potential uses uh, related to the regulatory space, whether that's transport policy, funding policies, uh, benchmarking and international activities, uh, funding programs, a lot on hydrogen transportation. Um, there's the power gen question related to CLCPA um, and generation analysis, uh, and then the hubs and, uh, of course, also marine uh, potential standalone or propulsion systems. Um, I'm striving to move ever faster here. Uh, for pilots and activities, uh, there's an interest in mapping existing projects, so just getting a sense of what's out there and a sort of one-stop shop, I suppose, to be able to articulate here's what's going on, uh, making sure that we're creating scalable models. Um, we heard a little bit about uh, salt cavern storage programs, so an opportunity to learn and share more about that perhaps or to hear from you that we need to dive deeper. Um, and then state-owned mobility asset transformation um, in terms of uh, existing infrastructure and what that could mean. Um, in terms of pilot activities on stakeholder engagement, um, you know, we heard some themes related to labor and workforce, um, public research and utility collaboration, and of course, continued public private research um, and government collaborations. Um, some on local communities, I need to dive deeper here, I think, um, in hearing more from what does it mean in terms of citing new infrastructure uh, and, of course, labor retrofitting and building new infrastructure, uh, local community feedback as well. Uh, making sure that we're hearing that uh, and utility stakeholder engagement and then the regional collaboration piece. So, again, this is an imperfect categorization and an imperfect synthesis of um, some of the things that we heard from you across the conversations today. Um, again, this isn't necessarily the space where we have all of the answers or where all the activities are happening. As Ian and others mentioned, this isn't you know, the primary space for conversation about New York's uh, proposal for a hydrogen hub as an example, but there are other places that those conversations are happening. And it's part of our team's uh, facilitation team's commitment is to be able to hear all these questions and help kind of connect the dots. Um, and I would just emphasize that uh, the hydrogen web page, uh, which we'll sit, share in the chat here uh, momentarily, if that hasn't already been done, is one key place you can go to learn more from NYSERDA. Um, with 
that, I believe we're, we're headed towards adjournment. I did mention that evaluation, so please do stand by um, for uh, uh, an opportunity to share more, not just on what else do we need to be talking about, but how did this work for you? I know that I can't speak for the NYSERDA team, but I can share, I, I, hear, I hear them often talk about how this experience has been and what else can we do to be um, ever better. Um, so an opportunity for continued sharing and learning about the, not only what we've talked about here, but the how we talked about it to make sure we're continuing to improve more for later. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Ian Latimer, again, the Senior Project Manager from NYSERDA to provide some closing thoughts and remarks before we let everybody go. Thanks, Jason. Um, if, if you're reticent to speak for my NYSERDA, I will do the best uh, to do so. Uh, which is to say all of that exactly is, you know, how, how I feel and how we feel as a team, you know, we, we very much feel that, you know, any success for hydrogen program development and hydrogen industry in New York needs to be done. So in concert with, you know, an understanding of, uh, stakeholders and their perspectives and, you know, bringing these conversations outside of regulatory filings and industry circles. So I really appreciate all of you guys for taking a few hours out of your your Tuesday post Memorial Day to, to hang out with us and learn about this. Um, as Jason has said, this is, you know, but a jumping off point in terms of both programming and opportunities for learning and exchanging information with NYSERDA. So we will be in touch. I would recommend anyone interested in future programming um, to join our email list, which is how we're, we're going to be able to share all of this information and the great projects that are happening at NYSERDA and elsewhere in the state. Um, I know there's some lingering questions in the chat pertaining to things like emissions and water use, and I can assure you that those are things that we are absolutely interested in exploring in future sessions. Unfortunately, um, I am determined to be the only hydrogen program that's ever ended on time, so I'm not going to go any further right now because we are just about at our 1 o'clock cutoff. But I just want to say again, my sincere thanks to everybody for tuning in today. My absolute thanks to the workshop advisory group that we have worked with in terms of identifying uh, speakers and topics and priorities here. Uh, we really couldn't have done it without that group. We want to make sure that we are being, again, responsible and responsive to our stakeholders here in the state by putting this together. So my sincere thank you to everybody, and we look forward to seeing you at the next session. Um, perhaps in the next month or so, we will keep you posted on timing using the clean hydrogen email. Um, so thank you. Really appreciate it. And Jason and Trevor, the, the Kearns and West team, and John and Trisha and everybody with NYSERDA, thank you guys for helping a smooth, uh, smooth ship or helping drive a smooth ship today. I don't know, something like that. Um, we'll end here. Thank you guys, everyone, so much for your time and look forward to seeing you at the future events.